Dear God, today as this session opens, we pray that your presence will be before us and everyone who serves in the decision-making process of our city. We pray for direction which will lead our city to be strong and unified. May we continue the legacy of our founders. May we be granted this day the wisdom to make decisions which will be for the good of our city. We also pray for your special blessings on all those who are working to transform our city and make it a better place to live and work. Amen. Please join us in the salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, to liberty and justice for all. Mr. Clerk, roll call, please. Councilor Janess. Here. Councilor Leahy. Here. Councilor Mercia. Here. Councilor Noon. Here. Councilor Robinson. Here. Uh, Councilor Rourke. Here. Councilor Scott. Here. Councilor Yum. Here. Amir Chow. Here. Councilor Drinkwater. Here. Councilor Gitchia. Here. That's 11 present. Do you have any moment of silence? Councilor Mercia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to offer a moment of silence in docking chamber for Ig Ingrid Seaver Bayless, a longtime Lowell Highland resident, loving wife of Walter Bayless, Jr. Ingrid, or lovey, as Wally would call her, settled in Lowell to raise their family. Ingrid wore many hats at Morse Bayless Funeral Home. She was the glue that held the business together, serving as secretary bookkeeper, arranging flowers, and answering phones. Lovey was always by Wally's side at his many community endeavors. Ingrid served as a silent co-chair to many of Wally's projects to benefit veterans and others in the area. Ingrid dedicated her life to her two daughters, Erica and Heather. She was always a homeroom mom and a parent volunteer to make crafts or bake for her daughter's classes. She was dedicated to the PTO and library at the Maury School. Over the years, she knitted hundreds of mittens to donate to those in need. She also served on the board of the Merrimack River, River Valley House. Ingrid adored her three grandchildren, Ben, Parker, and Ingrid, as well as her Scottish terrier, Macduff. As a tribute to Ingrid, she is asking for people to please get vaccinated and boosted for COVID, if not for yourself, for your loved ones. She is survived by her two daughters, Heather Reyes and Erica Zame, and her husband, Stephen. Her three cherished grandchildren, Parker and Ingrid Reyes, and Benjamin Zame. We offer our condolences to her family, relatives, and many friends. She will be truly missed. Let us also offer a moment of silence to all those who have passed since our last council meeting. May they all rest in peace. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Leahy. Thank you. I'd just like to also offer a moment of silence for Manny Freitas, uh, one of Lowell's famous boxes, and uh, he'll be truly missed. He was a great man and a, a true competitor in the ring. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, please dim the light. Mayor's Business 2.1, Communication Remote Zoom Participation, Motion to Accept and Place on File by Councilor Drinkwater, Second by Councilor Yam. Three, City Clerk, Minister of City Council meeting January 11th for acceptance, Motion to Accept and Place on File by Councilor Gishia, Second by Councilor Scott. Four, Communication from City Manager, Motion Response. A, motion response, offer public input. Any comment? Motion response B, 
Mr. Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so, slow. So I'll just ask to you, Mr. Mayor, the, manager, the next steps um, going forward. Uh, I know that some communities set up uh, committees as well. Um, so just, you know, the next steps. Madam yeah, Manager. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you to the council. So the uh, report kind of illustrates what we've uh, been doing so far with regard to ARPA. Um, and we are very close to having the ARPA um, finance director on board. Um, hopefully in the next week to 10 days, we'll be able to announce that. What we expect is the uh, ARPA administrator working with finance will then put together lots of the information suggested criteria, bring this forward to the council. I don't know if Mr. Baldwin wants to ex expand on the work that he and uh, others have been doing in, in regard to this. Thank you, Madam Manager. Uh, just to elaborate a little bit, the, the report in the packet for the council this evening details some of the public input that the city's been undergoing for the past several months, uh, a nonprofit subcommittee that, that was held several months ago, as well as uh, a series of um, public input opportunities the city's offered on the website and summarizes in the report some of the input we have received to date. We also did a survey of Lowell residents and the, um, the results of that survey are inclu included, excuse me, in the report before you this evening. Uh, as far as your question, Councillor, the process from here will be um, to bring together, to put a, a document, a budget plan together, uh, which we will uh, in present um, for informational purposes to the Council. Um, there, are, there are certain things that uh, I guess I will categorize as certain COVID-related expenditures that will just be um, kind of straightforward and put into the document. And then there will be others like addressing negative impacts, economic impacts, uh, which we will bucket into certain categories. And then the process from that will be sort of like an RFP um, uh, or grant kind of program that will run there, there from. Madam Manager. And we would expect the council may want to send it to subcommittee or have, uh, depending on the will of the council to have further a deeper dive on, in terms of areas, whether it's categories or specific expenditures. The, the one that um, I think is referred to in the report and has been mentioned before is, of course, lost revenue, which is kind of a, a, a finite number that is, comes off the top. But other than that, the council has a lot of flexibility with, around ARPA. Council Drinkwater. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to uh, Madam Manager or to, uh, to Mr. Baldwin, um, there's a, a reference on the second page of the report um, that refers to a, a process similar to how our CBDG money um, is allocated, uh, essentially through a, a competitive bid process. Um, just to, to kind of clarify, that, um, that RFP process, that's kind of specifically to allocate the money that's bucketed for the kind of the human services component. Um, I think it's defined as uh, you know, aid to disproportionately impacted communities or uh, disproportionately impacted individuals from the, the effects of the pandemic. So that, that's just how we're going to allocate that portion of the, the funding. That would be the suggestion for that specific category. So for example, um, we would anticipate um, for, you know, if, if it's a uh, nonprofit who services certain needs of the community, whether it has to do with housing, whether it has to do with homelessness and, and the like, to put together an RFP. The reporting requirements uh, are very strict. They're very similar to other federal programs that we must follow, as well as um, those who would be participating. So these are suggestions, you know, that we will um, present for further discussion with the council. I, I think that, that certainly makes sense, um, you know, for that, that bucket of funding to, to do a similar process. Um, I was wondering, with regard to another kind of eligible bucket of ARPA funding, um, infrastructure spending, um, I'm assuming there'll be a, you know, that'll be part of the, the plan that's put forward to the, the council. Um, and just in terms of timing, I know in, in just a few months, maybe four months, we're voting on a capital plan uh, in, in conjunction with the, uh, the annual budget document. And, you know, I know there'll be some um, capital projects that are prioritized and needed that are not eligible for ARPA funding, maybe some 
that are. Um, and obviously, I think it would make sense to, you know, for those that are eligible for ARPA funding to, to use that, that funding route to free up the bonding for other priorities that, that may not be covered. So just in terms of, of timing, is that something we're going to be able to, I'm assuming it's part of the planning process, you know, what's eligible and what's not. Is, is that something we'll be able to, to consider in conjunction with the, the capital plan that we get in a few months? Madam Manager? Yeah, we would anticipate that, especially around, and I'll just use this as an example, you know, the fire stations that we've talked quite a bit about, the repairs that have to be done, you know, which portion of those uh, are eligible for ARPA funding, perhaps, but not all, and having a capital plan that would complement and work with that. Um, you know, projects like that, it would, again, part of the discussion, it would be recommended that infrastructure is sooner rather than later simply because you know you, you you have a finite period of time to get these monies not just committed but expended and it sounds like a long time but really on projects it isn't and time goes by very quickly so those are some of the discussions that we anticipate in the kind of presentation that we bring forward and kind of have a have a full discussion with the council on that and thank you. Just, just to kind of quickly weigh in, in terms of the eligible ARPA uses, given the, the level of, um, of capital needs that we have, I, I think it's a, it's a blessing that we, that we have this to be able to kind of prioritize and, and potentially use some of that, uh, I, I guess, as pay-as-you-go funding and, and potentially free up um, some of the bond capacity for those, those other projects. So, you know, as you formulate the plan, certainly think it, it would be a wise investment to make those sorts of, uh, those sorts of capital investments given the, uh, the ARPA funding. So look forward to uh, being able to review the document. Uh, thank you. Councilor Scott. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Madam Manager. Uh, my only question was around the um, timeline and whether or not there's a, a deadline that we're supposed to have this report submitted. I thought it was January 31st. I'm not sure if that's accurate. Um, and then my only other um, area that I'm interested in is finding out how we're including private business. I saw on the Boston plan they had 30 um, community partners that were brought together that included nonprofits, for you know, banks, all different community partners. So I'm just curious what input we've gotten from the private sector. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Baldwin. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. So to address the, the, the first question about the reporting, um, there is certain interim reporting requirements related to ARPA, the first of which is January 31st, which um, the city will report on actual expenditures. At the moment, those will be only related to, to COVID uh, mitigation efforts as well as the lost revenue. Um, there is also a reporting requirement under ARPA for uh, having a plan, but that is only for municipalities over 250,000 in population. So we do anticipate, um, despite not meeting the criteria to develop a plan somewhat like that, um, but it is not that we have to report in the same way that a Cambridge or a Boston does, uh, I'm sorry, not Cambridge, but Boston and, and maybe Worcester um, be, because of the population. You could and as far that. as involvement with private business, how we're including restaurants, businesses? Yeah, we, we would uh, expect that, that one of the categories that the council would, would be interested in is, is not just for uh, for example, individuals, but also the businesses. And so we did a fair amount of this during uh, CARES funding in terms of trying to make um, grants available to businesses and would anticipate a similar process. Part and parcel of that, um, working with planning and development is um, you know, some, some training on the uh, process of applying and what is necessary. Because again, as I mentioned, uh, many of the requirements under ARPA, whether it's for the city or for recipients, if it's a business, it's pretty stringent, you know, the, what, what a business needs to have in order to be eligible and to participate. So uh, we, we did learn through the first part of the pandemic that a lot of our small businesses especially need quite a bit of um, help in, in formulating um, applications and and even having the necessary documents in order to be eligible. Um, so we anticipate that's gonna be part of the recommendation as well, because it, it was necessary during the CARES funding. 
Yes, Councillor Scott. Councillor Nguyen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I appreciate the appreciate the administration's you know you know priority in terms of uh, get go out there and solicit input from from the public, uh, the resident, the business, and the nonprofit. Um, I, I guess we need to do more of that. I, I, I don't honestly I don't feel that we've done enough. I understand that we we have yet to hire a finance the APA finance manager, but when we get that individual. Um, we need to be out there, uh, solicit input from everyone, you know, as, as, as many, as much as possible, because you need to do more of it and so that, you know, the public will understand that, look, you know, how we distribute this funding, uh, we've, we've been out there, we listen to everyone. So as much as you can do it, please do that. Thank you. Councillor Kishio. Thank you, Mayor Chow. Um, through you to Manager Donahue, I just have a couple questions. I, I, I think that the public input, after looking at the study, is kind of skewed. Um, when you start looking at 108 people uh, were surveyed, more or less, and 79 were from one place. Um, a bookmobile, I personally think we should look at talking to the school department and coexisting on money spent to purchase something like that. Uh, maybe use the Lowell Housing Authority because it would be somewhere where they also have some use out of it um, rather than look at that. But again, that's just getting into the weeds. Have we spent any of those funds currently? Sorry, I didn't hear the, have we spent it on? No, have we used any of those funds currently on anything? Uh, just on, on re recouping um, the, the lost revenue. Mr. Baldwin can speak to that. And then there's guidelines on how that has to be used. But... That's right. The, so there was about $7.9 million that was captured in FY 2021 for the lost revenue component. Uh, and then the, as of the most recent, in, the final final rule, uh, as opposed to the interim final rule, uh, communities can take a standard $10 million deduction for revenue loss. Uh, and so because we had gone through these calculations on, uh, pr according to the federal guidance, We've already come up with that $7.9 million number, which is justifiable, and we will take the difference between the 10 million and the 7.9, likely in FY22. Uh, any expenditures in excess of that have been related to COVID. So overtime um, for fire uh, and police that's related to COVID and then for testing. Would, would those expenditures be savings in the current budget? Would we have used funding that we normally would have used for some overtime and taken it out of that portion? Uh, have, have we okay. seen, I guess my question is more or less, have we seen a savings in the overtime budgets of each department based off of the way that you shifted the funding over? Uh, not necessarily, although I would argue that uh, it's, it's only because of COVID that we're spending a lot of this overtime. So it's it's difficult to say um, because we'd have to imagine a world without COVID in order to do so. Um, and this funding wouldn't be available in that hypothetical. Okay, because I've seen savings in other places where normally you have a custodial staff who works overtime, but now you can charge it off to COVID because they're putting more time into cleaning and disinfecting and stuff like that. So there is a savings in a budget that way because the same hours can be used somewhere else and, and it, there is a savings because you're actually doing COVID cleaning. Um, but anyway, regardless of that, the, the, other, the other question comes down to um, when we look at the COVID money and, and the opera money, can that be used for, say, like the high school project if costs start to go up because based off of it because of the increase in the time frame and everything? Can those funds be used to offset those costs? Because I, I truly think that you're the management team and not the public. And, you know, the public's going to throw wants out there that, you know, sometimes don't have continual. Like we looked at one, replace a person over at the library, which is a continual cost. But this is an opera money is a one-time fund. So that's a continual cost that we would pick up. So my thought process is that if we can offset some of, like you already said, some of the capital project, but the high school thing is really, you know, a bond burner right now when you're going to look at those costs and they're going to jump, whether it be heating or heating costs based off of the purchase prices. So we, we are looking at that, Councillor, to see what uh, might be eligible. There's also, we're also examining other federal funds that may have gone to for instance, DESI for such 
COVID-related expenses, so we're exploring that as well. We, we certainly would like to explore every aspect, as we talked about maybe last week with your motion, as far as um, uh, you know, tying this to COVID as much as we can. And because that's the reality, is COVID has changed um, everything, and, and we're not alone uh, on that. But, but you know, given our, our position and timing in the high school, we are gonna actively pursue that, including our own dollars, but, but if there are other uh, resources, we're gonna you know, make sure we exhaust all those opportunities as well. And I think that's the best opportunity for the taxpayer to keep their tax bills down is to try to offset the extra cost over there. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Robinson. Thank you. Yeah, um, my concerns were pretty much addressed earlier. And um, from what I've been reading, though, is it true um, we're not allowed to create positions with the ARPA funds? It's, again, it's uh, one-time expenses or directly related to COVID, but uh, anything long-term like creation of positions and stuff is, I thought, ruled out under ARPA guidelines. Thank you. Mr. CFO? Uh, th that's an excellent question. And with, with many things related to COVID and ARPA specifically, there's a lot of nuance to it. Um, and so if certain positions that are incidental to the program, um, for instance, the ARPA finance manager. That's a new position that's eligible to be funded by ARPA because it's directly related to the program. So, so long as positions are specifically related to the ongoing efforts of ARPA and its mission, then they would be allowable. But there are certain federal guidelines for all federal funds um, and supplanting, the, there's typical rules against supplanting where you can't not use the operating budget and use federal funds to supplant what would normally be uh, city funds as well as other um, you know, uh, procurement, et cetera, guidance we have to follow with the federal funds. I hope that addresses your question. Yes, thank you. So the position of the um, coming in to administer the, or help administer the ARPA money, that's when the money's gone, that position's gone or? That's right. Yeah, it's a temporary position um, so long as the ARPA um, program is in existence, which the expenditures wrap, have to wrap up in 2026. And then there, there's probably likely reporting after that, but that's probably the lifespan of the position. Thank Assuming it's still needed as we get further down the road. Thank you. Councillor Chines and Councillor Rook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll be quick because most of my questions were already previously answered. Um, the 7.9 million of lost revenue um, money that we've, we've been talking about, or the 10 million, however we want to look at it. Will that come entirely from the first tranche of money or will that be split across? And if we're still seeing depressed revenue for parking, water, sewer, any of that, um, w can we continue to make up those funds as we look towards the next year or two? And in which tranche will that money come out of? Thank you. So, Mr. Baldwin? The way that it's, it's looking right now is that both will come from the first tranche because that is when we will see the biggest revenue loss impact. Um, and so the way that it will work technically is that that revenue will replace the general fund and then it will be available for appropriation uh, through the free cash process. That process we can use to help uh, supplement in a way those other funds like parking or maybe water and sewer. Um, but that, that will be how the accounting or mechanics of it will work. Uh, but it is likely that it will be through that first tranche that we will use revenue loss to its fullest extent. Madam Manager? But uh, it is also our understanding that though we don't have a crystal ball and we don't know what future years look like for COVID, but if there is COVID, if, if you read the ARPA um, Act, then it, it does appear that if, it's, if the loss occurs during that stated period of time, we would be able to re recover that assuming we still had funds available to us. Okay, thank you very much. Councilor Rook. Thanks, I'll be brief. So it was being spent, um, you know, and, then if, and I know that the final decision does not lay out to council on this. Um, so, you know, are there suggestions that are gonna be made or are we gonna come in on a, on a Tuesday and find out that Eight millions on this, ten millions on that. Um, I, I guess like, the long and short of it is, is what direction does the council have 
if any, in the spending of the money. Madam Manager? Yeah, uh, so, so in terms of the lost revenue, uh, th that's the only fund funding that's been identified and will be recouped into the current, probably the FY22 budget. So you'll see it in there, Councilor, but it hasn't been spent. And any other thing that we're talking about, nothing has been expended. Uh, so the council will have input. You know, we, we've talked about kind of presenting a plan with input from the council as to what you, the council would like to see. And what we're trying to do is gather, um, now that we have the final guidelines, as much um, of, of you know, the uh, eligible expenses, how it fits in the needs, whether it's capital needs, human needs, what have you, of the city, so that the council has a full um, view of what, what uh, the potential is for the use of these funds. Yeah, so before any of the final decisions are made, you know, information will be given to the council with yeah. the costs and what oh, yeah, done, yeah. something like that. Okay, and then- Yeah, the but the only monies that, if you looked at the, the first half of monies that we've received, the only thing that you'd see out of that is the lost revenue that went into yeah. the general fund, but it hasn't been uh, spent on anything. I understand, thank you. And then the last thing is, I see uh, page 10, eligible categories uh, of expenditures. So is this the final, the, the, the final rules and regulations of what is eligible to be spent? I know that also seems to be changing on, also on a weekly basis as well. So the, the general categorical areas of uh, replacing lost revenue, addressing the negative economic impacts, those are all still the same. It's been the nuances of those uh, specific categories that has been finalized with the the final final rule um, and that has been namely around questions that have arisen as to the revenue loss calculations um, as, as well as some reporting requirements and uh, but but the categorical areas are still the same and will remain in place for the life of the program right. thank you thank you madam manager in in when we looked at the new you know final rules that came in like two weeks ago there were there were some examples of, okay, here's an example. This could be eligible use. This is an ineligible use. So as, as people have raised questions, the Treasury Department is further drilling down, saying you could use it for this, but not for that. So, um, so it's a little more guidance than what we got with the interim rules. Thank you. I just want to thank Madam Manager and Connor for preparing that report. I know it's been long uh, in the work for a few months now. Um, Councillor Mosia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I was happy to bring this motion forward because it generated an ample amount of discussion this evening and mostly what I would want to say has already been answered, but we, and you did provide a wonderful report along with a, an overview as to what ARPA funding can be spent on. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time but on the second page when it says allocation types and the amount, uh, and I want to know what is the difference between municipal 54 million and county 21 million? Uh, what is the difference with that? What does that mean? Yeah, Madam Manager? So we're, we're um, in a county that doesn't have an active county government. So the way the federal government sent out the funds, they sent money to municipalities, they sent money to counties. Um, so for example, Plymouth County has an active county. So the Plymouth County government is deciding how they spend that, their ARPA dollars in the cities and towns that are in Plymouth County. Because we don't have county government, Middlesex County no longer has that. We get a portion of that. So oh. we got 54 million, that was just for the city of Lowell, 23 or, or so, uh, 21, 21 for, that was our share of Middlesex County. So it came directly to the city, but from a different, uh, it's the same ARPA funds. Mm -hmm. It's just how the federal government allocated them across the country. And we can replace public sector revenue loss in the form of hiring like library personnel that was uh, shortened because of the budget constraints and we also can hire code or health inspectors, which I think we desperately need that. There's a lot of violations in the city. There's a lot of people that need help in that respect because they don't know what the rules are or whatever. I think that's very important. Um, and, and we also 
costs to retain employees. So because of the pandemic and because of retirement and because of so many factors, we have departments that are running low on help and are doing what they once did their own job and now doing the job at three and four and five people. And I think that's a burden on, on a lot of people. But also, we can also en enhance cleaning efforts. And when we can do that, which is a good thing, we should be able to get new filters for humidifiers. Um, so I think there's many things we can do. Uh, do we have an ARPA finance manager filled yet, that position filled yet? We're just about to um, announce that. I think it, the paperwork's being finalized. So we, we hope within the next uh, week or so that we'll um, be able to uh, bring someone on board. Thank you. Week or two. Um, and I wanted to say that we did have a hotline set up uh, where people could, this is the gist of my motion to see what did people have to say about it? What, what are their concerns? But the ultimate decision less with, is left to the administration. So whatever happens, this council should be uh, notified as to what the priority is, because I know there's so many concerns out there. When you see the list of people that had concerns, homelessness, very important. Um, so there's many categories here that we're trying to see. There's so much need that people don't know it unless they're involved with government and they know that this fire stations need to be done and we need a new police department. There's so much that we need. And it's like running a household. You can't get everything, and the kids need this, and the roof is ready to leak or whatever. So you got to set your priorities. So I just want to know what is the administration's priority so we could weigh in on it. And, and, and I think 108 people are not that many, but it's a start. And I think the, the campaign that we did go into different places to the voting districts, do we want district representation? We should fill that a same campaign with what do you think, what is the need that you see in your city? Is it infrastructure? You know, so, and, and Councilor Gitchia made some good remarks with the Lowell High School, and I know it's gonna run over with the costs that are going up through no fault of our own, but things do go up. And then you get the pandemic and everything seems to be blamed on that. Uh, the steel is going to be another eight or nine months uh, to, before we get it. There's a lot of factors that play into this. And so if we can take that burden and shift it away from the taxpayer and put it on to this windfall of money that we're getting, that would be a good idea. So thank you so much. It's uh, 7 o'clock, but we don't have any public hearings, so we're going to keep on going. Uh, Councilor Yam. Um, one of the six eligible, uh, eligible category of the APA is about the premium pay for essential workers. So I'm hoping that uh, when time comes, that will be defined uh, by the administration of what uh, those eligibility for essential workers, right? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Baldwin? So the, the premium pay requirements, as we understand them now, and these are all things we're working through uh, with our audit firm to better understand, um, there are certain income eligibility guidelines, and I believe that's both for whether it's public se sector or private sector premium pay. Um, and, and so you know, people who receive any kind of premium pay must fit within certain el income eligibility guidelines. And so if the, the city were to run a uh, maybe a grant program or something of that nature, we'd need to be able to ensure that the people, the recipients of those funds fit that criteria because we'll need to report that back to the federal government. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Scott, do you still want to make a comment? Are you done? Okay. Uh, Councilor Robinson? So that's, I was going to ask about the premium pay. Is that something, I know other communities have done it, and uh, is that something the city would be interested in doing, is, is running and finding out how many of our employees would fit into that basket? So it's, again, it goes into the uh, informed decision process. Yeah, we're, 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 that, that we will present all the information to the council. So, you know, the new, uh, the final regulations have some more definition around that. So 
would have to take a look at that. Many different communities have done different things, but we'll certainly be taking a look at that as well. And, and the only other thing is, um, <coughs> no, that's all. Thank you very much. Seeing no more comments, we're on to a uh, motion response B, development services website. Any comment? Councilor Kishio? I just wanted to thank the manager for uh, updating that. Thank you. 4.2, informational report. C, Lowell High School project update from representative of Suffolk, Perkins, Eastman, and Skanska. Madam Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you to the council. I know there's a pending motion that we'll have a more full response to, um, but uh, this did come up at last week's council meeting, and there was a, quite a lot of interest, and in, so we were able to have our consultants here this evening to make a presentation, give the council, of course, you know, brand new council, um, an update as to where we are on the project. And so here tonight to present is Rex Radloff from Suffolk, uh, as well as um, Sean Edwards is here from Suffolk as well. And I believe our, we have other consultants who are on the line if there are questions, so. Please proceed. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me today. I'm pleased to give this presentation of the um, Lowell High School uh, construction status. Before I move forward, I'd also like to introduce uh, Skanska, our owner's project manager, as well as Perkins Eastman, our architect uh, to the uh, new city council uh, who is here today. So today's presentation, I'm gonna go through the construction overview. That is just simply uh, hitting on a, a few points on where we're at with the uh, job itself, as well as share a couple photos uh, that gives a nice insight um, to where we're at. Then I'm going to roll into the phasing and enabling work. This is more of the technical side of what we are um, been working towards uh, for the, um, uh, uh, more of the technical side for what we're working towards uh, with um, getting uh, the students into and out of uh, the spaces as we're uh, uh, moving throughout the campus, as well as a procurement update. Uh, that's to give an update on where we're at with all things uh, buyout with subcontractors and upcoming uh, trades to be bought. As well as a, uh, the mi minority and women's, uh, women business uh, enterprise and workforce participation where we're trending today. And then open it up for comments and questions. So this is phase one. This is where we're at right now of the construction of the new gym. As everyone's aware here, we started in the fall of 2022 or 20. 20, uh, that is, with the takedown of 75 Arcan. That moved into foundations uh, in the wintertime, then steel erection, uh, and installation of the roof. That's what took place for the last uh, year or so. So tremendous progress. As far as work that's taking place right now, um, we're working towards on uh, completing the facade. That started up in the summer of 2021 with the brick and CMU. I'll share some photos on that as well as overhead MEPs, or that's short for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. And that takes up the vast uh, majority of the work, uh, which we're in the middle of, actually, towards the end of uh, right now. We're also uh, working through uh, the building with masonry, not just on the outside, but also in the inside. It being, this being a new gym, there's a fair amount of masonry as opposed to like age metal framing, which we're used to. And of course, finishes just started. Um, that kicked off with painting and we'll continue to move forward with, uh, with ceilings, floors, et cetera. And I'll share a few, a few ideas of where that's, where that's going next. And so uh, the work that we're looking forward to is the gym equipment that's slated for February of 2022, wood flooring April of 2022, and then also building startup uh, the summer of 2022. So just to recap, the last year and a half, we took down a building, we built a new building, and now we're working on uh, building out the guts of the building, uh, for the lack of a better term. Uh, in the next month or so, we're going to work towards the finishes, which everyone's very familiar with, I'm sure. Now, moving on to a few photos. I'm on the first floor entrance. I love this photo. It gives a nice um, insight on what the building looks like. Uh, a ton of systems going on here. We have electrical, we have fire alarm, we have plumbing, mechanical, fire protection, pipe insulation, CMU partitions, and then for this specific area, 
uh, believe it or not, we're going to uh, install a stair here, which we've actually just started, stair F. Now I'm sharing this photo just to illustrate uh, how much work is throughout the entire building that looks just like this. This is a great snapshot. Uh, the, the funny part to it is in a couple months you won't see anything, uh, which is great. Uh, but that's, that's why there's so much going on uh, behind the scenes. Moving on to the second floor gym, um, where the new track, basketball, volleyball courts will be. We just began uh, joist painting, which is another huge milestone for us. That means everything above and within the joists themselves have to be complete. Um, that's the MEPs, the mechanical, electrical, plumbing. Spiral ductwork, as everyone can see, kind of on the far end of, of the first photo, uh, a round piece of ductwork that's all the way through. This is some of the uh, longer lead, um, um, more intricate pieces of ductwork that we have to get into the building, which we've been able to get in uh, and install in a manner that's um, appropriate with the schedule. Also electrical, fire protection, uh, as well, uh, some other systems that we're getting in here. The photo on the right is actually a handful of locker rooms uh, that's taking place within the uh, second floor. We have locker rooms on the first floor uh, as well. And those locker rooms, metal framing, in-wall insulation. So uh, first floor, very heavy with, uh, with our mechanical electrical plumbing, or MEPs. Second floor, right now, we're kicking it off and moving towards with finishes, which is great. And then for the outside of the building, it's always tough right now uh, because it's, it's not until the building's done and uh, until everything looks great. Uh, but right now we have a CMU for the bottom course, the brick for the top course. That's substantially, or that is um, more or less wrapping up in the next handful of months, or weeks rather. And then also, as everyone can see, the tarping, which we have up there, that allows us to keep heating, heat in. However, you'll see a new um, cow wall uh, system. It's a translucent panel that will be installed in the, in the next handful of uh, weeks or more or less uh, a month and a half uh, until that starts to go in. Then also metal panels and a, and a few other systems that we'll have in. Also on this side of the building I'd like to point out our water, our gas, and our electrical. Uh, this is the utility installation. Has uh, been uh, brought in uh, quite a bit to the site and we're going to continue to do so uh, up until the springtime. And so what's up next? So again, I always like to go back to where we came from. We leveled the site, we built the structure, and we're getting the guts into the building. And the next steps is really just the finishes. Um, we're gearing up to start our finishes in the spring, which is great for us because that allows us to have plenty of time to uh, complete the first phase of this project uh, by the summer of 2022. Uh, and that, that consists of um, setting remaining air handling units, that's your AHUs, also a generator. This will allow us to get systems uh, that we've installed, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, to actually start running and actually start being used for the job itself. And then afterwards, we'll install gym equipment, install ceilings, install lights, it'll actually look like a building. And that goes quick. Um, then athletic flooring. That's very sensitive to environmental conditions, so that's why it's very important to have our mechanical systems up and running. And then also wood flooring as well. Um, same caveat as the athletic flooring. We'll be finishing it off with bleachers, lockers, toilet accessories, and what we also call specialties. That's your um, smaller items like fire extinguisher cabinets uh, and anything else that may be on, on walls, signage, etc. cetera. Uh, and then of course, startup of the building and commissioning. I'm going to take a step back. Startup and commissioning, I think I've said already, that's in short just us turning on the lights, uh, us turning on the air, us making sure that the water temperature is the right temperature. Um, that will take uh, a handful of weeks, but we're gearing up to uh, start that process in the summertime. So moving on to phasing and enabling. So behind the scenes, as everyone can see, um, Going back to our original slide, the phasing plan, we have about 14 jobs that we're, we're jumping into the existing space itself. These, these projects are the, um, these projects really underline how, how challenging this job really is. Uh, the gym is going to be awesome, no doubt, but it's a relatively straightforward project. Uh, and I hate to say it, even the freshman academy, but some of the more difficult items and the reason why we're we've spent so much time uh, digging into this job, is, is reworking existing systems while students are within the building itself. 
Not only are we going to build a new gym, but we're going to take down the existing gym in the existing building uh, while it's being occupied. So there's a fair amount of rework uh, in that building, rework that has to be done now. So I'm sharing this slide just to show the intricacies of where we're going to be, when we're going to be there. And as you can see, these are the jobs that's coming up uh, for the next year. Um, this is about half of the projects um, throughout the duration of the job. And we'll continue to, to work through it. OK, I'm going to move on to procurement update to talk about all trades which we've bought out to date, as well as uh, remaining trades uh, which are on the docket. The, so the trades which we've put under contract, I won't repeat all of them, as everyone can see here. But drywall, structural steel, that's only for phase one. Demo, food service, uh, some of your um, bigger ticket items like concrete, current wall for phase one as well, site work, gym equipment. Um, a fair amount of um, trades have already been bought, bought out. However, the remaining, the remaining trades to be bought out, I have under pending buyout, will be fireproofing. That's for the phase two, three, and four. We don't have fireproofing in phase one. It, the code doesn't call for it. Stage rigging and curtains, as well as fixed audience seatings. Uh, that's for phase three, where we have the auditorium that we're renovating. Acoustical panels. Uh, these are panels that go in uh, within the classrooms to provide for an acoustical effect, uh, quieter classrooms, if you will, as well as steel, current wall, and metal panels for phase two through four. These are some really big trades that we're uh, working towards right now to be bought out in the, in the handful of months, as well as projection screens and final cleaning, some just final, final ticket items to be bought out. As far as the MBE, or WBE, MBE, and workforce plan, I'm sharing uh, the, um, the numbers which we've been able to achieve today. So total construction minority workforce is at 24.5% of workers, or 120 workers, 13,000 hours. This is to date. Of course, it's a very long project. Uh, so many more years and many more hours to come. Total female workforce is at 3.2, and that's 16 workers, 1,800 hours. And then total Lowell residents, which I'm happy to share as well, 11.5% uh, of all workers, that's 35 workers and 6,400 hours. With a total MBE, WBE contract awards uh, to date of 13 million. That is the, um, th those are the uh, minority and women owned businesses, not to be confused with actual workforce, the workers on the job that is. And I'm sorry, I feel like I sped through it a little quick, but um, so I'd like to open up any comments or questions. Councilor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for this report. Um, just a couple of quick things I wanted to hit on. We talk about procurement for stages two through four. Yes. Um, how much are we being impacted by, you know, greater supply chain issues, COVID things, et cetera, um, in terms of any delays from the original anticipated schedule? I understand, you know, everything's kind of a moving target and will continue to be so. Um, just wondering where we stand now and, uh, you know, what are the biggest potentials for holding us back from, from meeting our deadlines as we see them now? So without a doubt, COVID is, touches everything. Um, and it has made this project more of a challenge than other jobs. Um, however, as far as the schedule goes, uh, we're completely on top of it. Um, no concern with meeting the schedule um, because of any impacts that happened through COVID. I mean, I hate to say it, but that's why we're here. Uh, that's why Suffolk is here. Uh, we know how to manage this. Uh, even, even in search, um, situations like uh, dealing with a, uh, a nationwide pandemic, um, we have a very strong influence with not only our subcontractors, but also our vendors to be able to, um, to make sure that Lowell High School is a, pri a priority to them. And that's essentially what our strategy. It's just being able to wield our influence with our subs and with our vendors. Okay, thank you. And the other side of that is, of course, uh, cost. Have we seen significant impacts? I know steel went through the roof for a while. It is starting to come back down. Um, I don't know what we see for, um, for overages uh, as things lay right now. Sure. So for the remaining packages that we're buying, I can't comment on cost because we just don't have it yet. However, I do know that these packages are being competitively bid, so we will always get our best value for it. Um, I, I hate to leave it at that, but that's, 
um, that's as best as um, I know today. Uh, we won't know until uh, those packages are bought. And when do we, when does when is that work expected to begin? Say the stage two, uh, phase two procurement is that already ongoing? It, it is ongoing right now. Correct. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Awesome. Councilor Cuccio. Thank you for the presentation. Um, quick question, as I look at the, the drawing itself, um, it, it's a beautiful building, but one, one question comes to mind, and I think people have probably already started to ask this question, and there's no solar panels on the top. Um, and, and I think that when you do a $343 million building of this size, and it's, one, it's the largest in, in the state, that we should find a way to get some solar panels up there and, and try to get some cost savings. So I don't know where that is, uh, Rex, but as I look at the building and I see everything, I, I just think that, um, and maybe it's in the process, I don't know, I'm just looking yeah. at the drawing. Um, I'm hoping that the roof loads will take them and everything, you know, because again, those roof loads are probably gonna have to take different rooftop units in years to come, so yeah. I'm sure they're over um, engineered, but that would be my question is, uh, are we looking at more solar panels through the mayor to the manager and also um, I'm hoping that happens because when you drive by a brand new renovation like this that's going to be one of the major things people are going to look at wow you did nice but there's really no cost savings for the resident on, on electricity thank you madam manager thank you um, just quickly so the uh, project has been designed to accept solar but the MSBA doesn't participate in solar so it would be something that we have to do at in addition to at, at the expense, but it, it is designed to accept solar. Could we do it at the same time as we have the contractors on site? Wouldn't it make sense to have that all installed at the same time so that you have the engineering, you have the, uh, the uh, OPM and everybody there to, to make that, to, to look at that as it's going through? I know it's not reimbursable, I understand right, that, but right. you have it, the It's a question there. of the cost, but we can, we can, and I know the architects have been looking at this. I think uh, Joe Drown is on, if he can be let in. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Manager. Uh, we have uh, included um, the design to accept coal, uh, solar panels uh, on the building, uh, both for the structural support of them, as well as the uh, utility. So the pathways for um, all the um, uh, utility uh, cabling uh, are incorporated into the design. So, so what I'm hearing is that it's all there and it would be the city's obligation to now put it in place so that we can actually get it on when we do the opening or the ribbon cutting in the end. So I just think that that's an important piece to try to get it all together. So procurement wise, I'm sure it's, it's not going to be an easy thing because it's a very competitive market when you start looking at everything. But I just think that there's a savings there that can be done through the electricity for years to come. Thank you. Councilor Rook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just a couple of questions. So we, we're dealing with a bridge issue on Central Street. I'm sure you, you deal with it all, all the time, yep. working at Low High. And the excuse being made the, you know, the whole time period is a delay in supply chain and, and steel and whatnot. So you're saying that as far as this high school project goes, that won't be a problem? That will not be a problem on this job. Okay. And, you know, not being a wise guy, yeah. maybe you can talk to the city administration about, you know, some of the supplies that we're lacking and we're on a Central Street Bridge. We've been behind for months, if not a year, on that one. And secondly is that with the budget that is given for the high school project, um, is there any projections that are done on a regular basis um, to say, you know, we're going to need this or you just wait till the time comes to to buy what it is you buy and then deal with it then? As far as um, uh, projections with the budget goes? It, so traditionally, yes, uh, because of the flux in the market is just so uh, deferring on a uh, daily basis, on a monthly basis, it's very difficult to pin down on exactly where the market stands until we actually have numbers in hand. So it's something that we've, we've looked at uh, in the past, um, but um, other than because the market is so in flux, it's just hard to understand where we're at. So over the past year, 18 months, it's only gone up? It's gone, it, it's fluctuated quite a bit. Right, so I, I guess I manage, I don't know if this is something that would benefit the city as well, you know, to get some sort of ballpark figure of what it's gonna cost 
you know, for the start of phase two or phase three, I mean, if we get to a certain point where you're talking, you know, one and a half times or two times the price, or maybe, you know, with your experience, you know, do you think the prices will go down? Who knows? But it's just, you know, it's better to, to be proactive than reactive. And I just, mm -hmm. you know, did, not sure about waiting until, you know, the very end of one phase to start another one to, to you know, to purchase, I guess, materials that are obviously in demand and that are a very high cost. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank you. Councilor Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to echo and commend my colleague, uh, Councilor Gitchia, um, for his uh, comments around solar panels. I think it's penny wise and pound foolish for us not to do it at the same time while the engineers are there, while this is going on. Um, I know it's a costly thing to do, but for us not to think about long term energy savings on a building this large just really doesn't make any sense. So I would just want to support what he had mentioned. Thank you. I have uh, no further comments. Uh, Councillor Leahy. Thank you. Just one other question. Um, have we, so everything's going pretty good over in phase one. Um, we haven't had to do any reductions or cuts or we're not trimming anything out, right? Everything's as planned so far? Effectively, yes. There's always uh, opportunities to, are, are you asking, uh, uh, if we've gone through a VE process, a value engineering process, where yeah, I guess so because there's just rumors going around that we're starting to, you know, we're not gonna. Uh, sure. Yeah. So we've gone through a, a minor value engineering process. Uh, the 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 building itself is is designed very practically. Uh, there's, um, you know, we're we're getting a great project or a great building, no doubt. Um, however, there's there's not a lot of flashy. Uh, or high-end finishes, which is very pragmatic, if you will, uh, to be pulling out. Um, so there's always opportunities to um, go through a VE process, which we've done subtly, um, but it's effectively uh, complete uh, in that regards. All right. I just want to make sure that um, as we finish up the gymnasium and we make sure that all the new equipment that was promised to come in uh, will be coming in and to make sure that... Uh, all practical uses of the building you know like there was a rumor that the loading dock was being cut out or something but i don't know yeah no the the building is being built as designed uh, i can say that uh, anything that we have touched through the value engineering process is something that the end user would uh would um i don't want to use the term never know because you know you don't know mm -hmm. what you don't know uh but items that may not be necessary um but the, the, the building itself is being built as designed. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councilor Mosia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to this gentleman here, have you run into any cost overruns thus far? Um, in what regards? As far as buying out the project itself? As or... far as material that you anticipated, X number of dollars, but it costs you more. Um, as far as... Uh, you know, supplies or as far as payroll or sure. anything associated with what you've done to this point, have you anticipated more money than what it, you expected? Sure. So um, the contracts that we um, have subcontractors um, sign up on uh, do, do not allow for any terms of escalation, any terms of added labor or anything or added cost due to labor or materials. So once we have bought them out, um, that's the price that we have. So they, um, the subcontractors uh, may be incurring costs depending on how they sign up their vendors, but those costs are not passed on to us. So you don't anticipate any overruns? Uh, I do not anticipate any escalation uh, based on the contracts that we have purchased to date um, or escalation based on the contracts uh, once we sign up the subsequent trades. Um, because I'll, I'll be watching very carefully. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment? Uh, Councillor Rook? I know we're getting the report in a paper form you know, in a week or two, and actually with the uh, presentation, I kind of almost forgot about it. Um, can we get a total number of, of tax dollars that were spent uh, on the taking uh, of uh, Akan Drive, their, move, their uh, moving costs, uh, everything from soup to nuts? I don't know if that's ever been given to the council. Um, if it has, maybe just, you know, the report from before. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for coming in to make your presentation and answer these very important questions from the council body. 
Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I need a motion to accept and place on file by Councillor Drinkwater, second by Councillor Rook. Five, votes from the city manager. Mr. Mayor. Oh, yes. In Council adding Mercier. to Councillor Rook's uh, request for information, do we, could we have any information if the doctor's office and the, the um, ongoing, is there anything ongoing? Is there anything still in court? Do we know of any, another word? Yeah, we'll get your report up, up to the present. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, going forward, uh, five votes from the city manager. 5.1, vote, accept, and extend fiscal year 22 body one camera program grant where full reading and second reading by title. Vote authorizing the city manager on behalf of the city of Lowell to accept and expand a grant from the executive office of the public safety and security regarding the FY 2022 law enforcement body one camera program award in the amount of $29,935 for use by the City of Lowell Police Department. Need a motion to adopt by Councillor Leahy, second by Councillor Juness. Mr. Mayor. Uh, any discussion? Yeah. Councillor Nguyen? Um, I think Councillor Leahy is first. Councillor Leahy. Uh, sure. Councillor Leahy. Um, through you, the manager, I just, could you just give us a brief or someone just like how many cameras does this include um, and what happens to the cameras are they um, do they need to be charged so do they do one shift and then skip a shift and go to a shift and how many did we get and how many where will they go and and then what would be the plan to buy more yeah th thank you so this is would go toward a pilot program um i i believe marianne manzi is on the call um who has uh been in charge of this not just this grant is can she be let in mr I'm, clerk yes yeah, she's, she's in the okay good um, evening madam manager yeah marianne could you um explain the uh pilot program. Uh, I don't know if you heard Council Leahy's questions. Uh, yes, I did. Thank you. Um, we are starting off this, uh, the body worn camera program with a um, pilot program. And the plan is to have 10 on each shift. Uh, so 10 on days, 10 on early nights and 10 on late nights. Um, for a year, we received funding through the state for the um, equipment only. Um, and uh, the plan would be down the road is to expand to um, to everybody having um, a, a, a camera, all um, eligible employees having a, a camera, a body worn camera. Uh, we're just in the um, beginning process of procurement. We uh, need to follow Mass General Law 30B procurement law, so we'll be going up to bid. Um, and in regards to the the batteries, um, I'd have to. That's a real technical question. I'd have to really uh, go back, look it up, and get back to you on that. Um, but where we're having 10 people on, 10 officers on each shift, um, that shouldn't be an issue. But honestly, I really need to go back and look into that piece of it. And forgive me, does that answer all those questions? Or I might have missed one, Council Leahy. No, that was good. I just, just for our reference, how many, I guess, officers are on during one shift, though? If we're doing 10 per shift, what's so I imagine the day shift is the biggest? Yes, the, the day shift is the biggest. The uh, late night shift uh, does have the, the least amount, but we want to make sure we have coverage on all um, on all shifts. OK, and just one quick question. If the if uh, the program, the pilot program seems to be moving along, going very well, would we expedite the year long period? Madam Manager. Yeah, thank you. Um, ju just quickly, so uh, we, we bargained for this in the collective bargaining agreements, both superior officers and um, for patrol. Uh, so it, it is part of the agreement. The idea that the administration of the LPD had was to start with a pilot program. It's pretty typical. 
um, because the uh, just getting used to the technical aspects. So, for example, uh, the training on how, how to use the cameras, when to use them, what what uh, are are acceptable uses. There is docking stations um, that where the cameras would would charge. They'd be assigned to certain officers. So there's there's a whole process, and then of course there is backing up the uh, footage and having the technical expertise to keep all of the camera footage backed up. Um, that's also part of the pilot program. Um, you know, it doesn't exist right now, um, so it's going to have to be all put together. It's very possible uh, if this goes smoothly, and we have no reason to think it wouldn't, uh, we could do it sooner uh, than, than one year. Um, of course, funding will always be the issue. We're going to continue to pursue federal funding um, as well for this program um, and any other funding that comes along. But so subject to, to um, funding, uh, it will be whether it can be advanced sooner in any particular budget. Thank you. Councillor Nguyen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Madam Managers. Um, so this is a one-year grant, um, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So this grant is going to afford us, say, 10 camera, body camera? Well, we're not, I, that I can't answer. It does have to go out to bid. Okay. Uh, you know, we did look at a couple of companies to see, you know, how, they, how these operate uh, and the like. But anybody who is going to respond to this would have to uh, bid uh, on these, so then we'd, that's when we'd know what the actual cost would be. So the officers that assigned to the camera, are they volunteer into the, this pilot project? Well, uh, I, I believe the chief um, would, would choose, uh, it, as I said, it's all subject to the collective bargaining agreement now, so everybody has agreed to participate in the body-worn uh, camera program. Uh, so I, I would leave that to the chief, but I believe the chief would decide how to implement the, the pilot. And then it applies to everybody once it's out of the pilot stage. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that you're not only, you know, uh, looking for this grant from the, you know, e, EOPS, uh, but you're also going to seek federal grant, I, you know, because I believe in this project, really, because uh, I think the public, too, uh, it, this is going to be even strengthening the trust between the uh, uh, officers and the community. Um, so, so it's a great project. You know, I, mean, I have no doubt it's going to work. Just a matter of where we're going to get money to expand it. Uh, so thank you, Madam Manager. Councillor Yam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, Madam Manager has mentioned a bit uh, on the, my question that I'm going to ask. is regarding maintain the footage um, and, um, and security of the footage. So those are the concerns, you know, um, that would be my question. But you, Madam Manager, you touched a bit, a bit on it. And we'll probably learn more when it go into effect. Yeah, thank you. Madam Manager, would you like to have any comment or? Yeah, no, that, that is correct. You know, obviously we don't have um, personnel right now that does that or, uh, or even the, the uh, technical aspect, but that has to be part of uh, even, even at the pilot stage, of course, because uh, that's the critical part is having the camera footage available and maintained. Anything else? Councilor Jenez? Uh, thank you. Piggybacking off of... Um Councilor Yam's questions. Uh, specifically, I'm just curious if the plan of this pilot is to just have continuously running cameras throughout the whole shifts, or is this going to be something that the officers would, would activate under whatever prescribed set of circumstances we have? Um, and then the other question is just how long do we preserve, or are we planning to preserve this footage for? Um, I assume that's probably covered by some statute. Thank you. I believe it is, Councilor, covered by the statute. Um, I don't have that period of time, um, but we can get that. But I believe it is covered by law. As far as the um, operational aspect of the camera, uh, again, that's kind of covered by law and, and policy. Um, there's certain times that an officer can turn a camera off. Uh, it's my understanding if, if someone goes to a private residence and the resident doesn't want the camera on, they 
would turn off. So there's a lot of rules around uh, camera operation when you shouldn't turn it off. Um, and that's part of the training um, for officers as well. So that will all be part of, you know, part of rolling out this, this project. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Scott, then Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, the city manager. My question is just around uh, the, the footage and uh, with the legal department. I mean, has, is this something that um, we're setting up policies for, uh, you know, training with the legal department? Because I'm just concerned whether or not, you know, this footage is allowable. You know, like if a police officer is attacked, I mean, is that something? Or is it more for our own internal usage for, you know, personnel issues? Madam Manager. It's my understanding that in other um, communities that have the body worn camera program, uh, the footage um, can be used for internal purposes, but it, it can be also subpoenaed by, for instance, defense attorneys um, uh, or uh, uh, for court purposes. So there's a, you know, it can be asked for um, in a number of ways. I, I, I did, and I don't know, you know, have those statistics, but it seems that in some communities that hasn't been as huge an issue because the truth is the camera speaks for itself and maybe people don't find it that useful to subpoena into court depending on how you know people were behaving but but that's the whole idea is um to have you know the the accurate depiction of what's going on when an officer is interacting with people on the street so it could be used for both but it certainly is subject to being uh, subpoenaed maybe the solicitor could expand on that all of that is uh, all of that is correct and uh, and as the manager indicated um, the uh, the whole um, process will be evolving and so part of that evolution will be the uh, setting up of um, you know, databases and retrievals and, um, uh, and people to review what gets released and what doesn't as part of public records requests. Thank you. Yes, that was my point. So it definitely could protect our police officers and, you know, to have that footage in place. So a Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Councilor Robinson. Thank you. Um, you touched on briefly the technology and, and the backup and storage and you said uh, we won't be doing that in-house, or is that going to be like a vendor that's going to come in and do that, or does this? Oh no, I think it would be in-house counselor. I mean, we don't have a department right now, but we'd have to set up the position in the police department. We'd have to create a um, position for for maintaining that um, the footage and so forth. Okay, and will that happen as part of this pilot program? Well, it, it certainly will have to be part of the pilot program. We're going to have to have those, um, that capability in, in place um, in order to roll that out. But whether it resides in the police department or MIS, I don't think that's been determined yet. But it would have to be a new position to um, maintain that footage. That's what we would expect. We haven't seen a budget yet from the police department because this is all new, but we'd expect to be bringing that forward once the pilot program was ready to be launched. And, and, and the grant only covered the uh, equipment itself, correct? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the pr these programs are pretty expensive. Uh, you know, the grant, uh, I mean, they applied and, and got a grant, but I'm not sure how much it will cover. We're going to continue to try and seek other grant opportunities, but um, but to provide this program for an entire department, it's expensive. You know, we'll we'll look at um, budgets as we come down the road. But both for pilot and the council will have all those facts and figures. We don't have them yet because it has to go out to bid, and and then we'll also try and um, get an idea of. You know what the what the personnel positions would be. Thank you very much. Any other comment? Seeing none, Mr. Clerk, roll call, please. Council Janess. Yes. Council Leahy. Yes. Council Mercia. Yes. Council Noom. Yes. Council Robinson. Yes. Council Rook. Council Scott. Yes. Council Yum. Yes. Mayor Chow. Yes. Council Drinkwater. Yes. Council Gitchia. Yes. That's eleven years. Six uh, reports. We don't have any subcommittee reports. Uh, we're going to 6.1.
while inspection, national grid horizon, request installation of one geo pole relocate, two geo poles at Tan and Plain Street, Tanner Street realignment, motion to accept and adopt accompanying order by Councillor Mercier, second by Councillor Nguyen. Seven, petitions, 7.1, claims, two property damage, motion to refer to law department for report and recommendation by Councillor Jeunesse, second by Councillor Scott. Seven point two miscellaneous. Mohammed Aladini Lemon and Thyme Restaurant requests installation of overhanging sign at four ninety one Dunn Street. Motion to refer to law department for report and recommendation by Council Rook, second by Council Robinson. Seven point three. Boston Gas DBA National Grid requests replacement of low pressure gas main along 12th Wachusett and July Street. Motion to refer to public hearing on February 1st, 2022 at 7 p.m. by Councillor Nguyen and second by Councillor Mosia. Eight, City Council motion. Mr. Mayor. Can I, um, Councillor Rook. Please request we take 8.11 um, 8 out of order. I believe we have a representative from Waste Management with us tonight. Second, Second by Councillor Mosia. If you want to do 8.9 as well, it's one of our cuts that get you as uh, motions too. What number was that? 8.11. Motion 8.11. Council Robinson requests city manager provide council with an update on missed and or delayed solid waste pickup. Second by Councillor Rook. Madam Manager. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. So there, there have been um, missed pickups, especially of recent, uh, with with the storm and the holiday and so forth. Um, and I know many councilors um, have concerns about that. And of course, Councilor Robinson filed a motion about that. I, um, we do have a representative from waste management. Um, who should be on the call, um, but I don't know whether there's specific questions or we want an explanation. I just want to make sure he's addressing what the concerns are. Thank you, Madam Manager. Um, it's just, it's a reoccurring issue. And, um, you know, we, we've discussed it in the past as to staffing shortages and, and COVID pandemic, I mean, but at the end of the day, we have a, a contract in place and, and we're not seeing a discount as a result of these excuses. So it's, it's residents are sick of it. And uh, I think the council is pretty sick of it. And, and I just like to hear as to why it keeps happening and um, what steps is the contractor taken to avoid this from happening? I mean, we've been here before many times and it's still as of recently as today, I'm getting complaints from constituents that are, uh, still hasn't been picked up in areas that, you know, they, they're expecting a day delayed due to the holiday, still sitting outside with snow and ice all around it. And um, as windy as it's been lately, another problem with this is it's making a mess of the neighborhoods. The covers are blowing open, the garbage is blowing around because they're sitting out there longer than they need to be. So I'd like to hear the reason why. Thank you. Madam Manager, you wanna hear all the comments from the councilors first before you make the uh, Sure. Uh, Whatever. Councillor Mosia. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let me just tell you how frustrated I am without using any foul language or whatever, but let me just say, let's take a street, Mount Hope Street. It's not a dead end street. It's a street that you go all the way down. Trash in recycling is there last week, Monday. It was on Monday in Pawtucketville, yard waste, um, not yard waste, uh, trash and recycling. So the truck goes down, takes everybody's except three people, three neighbors. How does that happen? That I can't blame that on COVID. I can't blame that on uh, sickness or lack of people. The truck is going down and they miss 
three, three neighbors. So I call City Hall and say, could you please make, uh, not City Hall, DPW, could you please ha uh, have the truck go back at the end of the day and pick it up? Now, Monday was the trash pickup day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, nothing happened. It was still there. Saturday, it got picked up. Saturday, it got picked up. Having said that, I could be irritated by it. This is the third time that this has happened. It's not like it was an oversight. How do you miss three neighbors three weeks in a row? I, 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 don't, I don't understand that. And you know what they said? Oh, well, he probably, oh, some of the neighbors, especially the one that you're concerned about, probably put it out after the fact after the fact, so I'm sure he did that three times. He put it out after the fact. He's only lived there like 50 years. I don't think that he would not know when to put his trash out. In fact, I asked him that very question. He put it out with the other two neighbors the night before. So if they came in the morning, he didn't want to rush out or be at work or whatever. He put it out the night before, before he went to bed. I don't understand that. I can't understand that. I can't blame that on COVID. I, I don't know what to blame that on, but I don't know what the answer is. I just don't. I'm frustrated, and so are the three neighbors on Mount Hope Street. And I hope I don't have to call for the fourth time. Thank you. Councilor Kishio. You know, when, when you look at the yard waste pickup and also the trash pickup, you, one has to come to the conclusion it puts a hardship on the resident when it isn't picked up on the day. If you have a household like mine that has four people in it, that little red barrel they gave us through the years is full every week, and so is the recycle bin. So every day that goes on, we end up buying purple bags to put out there. So there's a hardship that goes on, and I would be very interested in hearing this excuse that's gonna come because when I worked for the Ashes and Waste, and I'm the only one in this room that worked there, it was snowing and we went to work. We didn't get days off. And if we didn't finish our route, we worked on Saturday. And if we didn't finish that, we worked. I don't understand where you have a truck with an arm that's weighted down. If the tires are good on it, there should be no problem with driving that truck and picking up trash. If there are some streets, oh, okay, I can give you some streets, Burnside or something like that, that you might slide down. But I, I don't understand, and, and I would love to hear the excuse because, um, and maybe it's a contract. Maybe the contract says if you're not done by 6 o'clock on Friday, then you go home till Monday. I, I don't know, but I, I would highly doubt that that was written in any contract that this city has ever put out. But I don't understand why they're not incurring the cost and the resident is incurring the cost because the purple bags are out everywhere in this city. And, and you know, we've got good residents who are trying to keep the city clean but there's really no way when you're trying to do that. So I'll wait for further comment after we hear the, the um, contractor speak because to me, the contract's not being upheld and I don't know that there are fines, but I, I believe in some of the contracts, if it's not picked up within 48 hours, that there's a, there's a stipulation where you can actually give warnings and then fine. I think we're beyond the warning stage, but. Councilor Rock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, you know, this is obviously not the first time we've dealt with this. We got a motion response back August 6th of 2021, um, detailing the same problems, uh, the same issues, um, but yard waste at the time. Um, in the response, it said that the city had notified waste management um, that uh, there'd be a fine, um, a notification uh, of fines in the amount of $46,000. Um, you know, has that been c collected? Uh, and then also, they also said that uh, they would have seven new drivers added by August 30th, fully trained uh, new hires. Um, you know, has that been, is that, um, you know, been done as well? Um, you would think that if that's the case, you know, we should be dealing with this any, any longer. Um, and again, you know, my colleagues have probably said it better than I have. It really is, um, you know, a quality of life issue for the neighborhoods. Um, you know, I, there was, I understand that the notification process can be difficult, but, you know, the report also says that DPW and waste management are in daily contact. Um, you know, I, maybe, I don't know if it's my, my, my phone or not, but you know, I got a, a social media message from the city 
saying that, you know, pickup will be delayed, and this was two days late after it was already delayed for a day. Um, you know, so communication could be uh, maybe improved. I don't know if there's a phone call that can be made that can go out to a neighborhood that if you know it's going to be late. Um, then, you know, also uh, comes to get you brought up the excess bags, the ex ex uh, excess trash. Um, to your knowledge, Madam uh, Manager, you know, are they, are they, are they finding people when they're late? If someone puts, uh, I did see some bags out. Uh, but talking about that weren't the purple bags, and I did see they were picked up. Hopefully those residents weren't, you know, violated or given a citation for such. Um, you know, understanding everything uh, that's going on. I mean, it, it should have been back in August that it was taken care of, right? Um, and uh, obviously, obviously not. So, thank you. Councilor Leahy. So, uh, just one quick thing to bring up while we have the representative. Um, I just noticed, too, that when they're trying to make up on the roots, they seem to be going a little too fast. Sometimes they're not shaking the barrels out enough and they're leaving them half full. And the other thing is, um, are we experiencing any problems with uh, more breakage? Because if they're rushing and they're slamming the barrels down quicker, are they breaking wheels or tops off? So I've noticed a lot of wheels and barrels being broken. So that should be just taken, uh, we should take a look at that too. Thank you. So this ha we did go through this um, with the yard waste <clears throat> in the summer. Um, we saw <clears throat> an, an improvement um, for a period of, of weeks in the fall as far as yard waste. <clears throat> the barrels and the condition are an issue and there's a, a, a lot of repairs that have to happen to the barrels. That's something that we struggle with. Uh, the fines are ongoing. Uh, we're up to $78,000 now in fines. Um, and and that's you know uh, that's in the, in the law department working um, as far as what we pay them a lot of money, but we have we are assessing fines where it's appropriate under the contract. Um, I, you know we can let Mr. And, and we'll get a report, but I just because this was a big issue this past week, I think we all heard about it um, between as I said, you know the storm the holiday, uh, the restrictions on the number of hours the drivers can work, what happens then, you know, this has been very frustrating for everybody. Uh, and I'll let uh, the representative, Mr. Nosella, speak to this. Um, but, you know, even on Friday, um, <clears throat> it was, we weren't truly aware what they weren't in, were and were not going to get to. We un also understood they'd be out on Saturday Part of the challenge is, depending on how many hours, they can't work more than 60 hours. Uh, and, and so not, a, not all of the crews came on Saturday. So, and then Monday holiday, it was just the perfect storm, it was the imperfect storm. But if Mr. Nosella could uh, address some of the concerns, I think it's important that he hears directly from the council about the, the frustrations um, that they're hearing from everybody. Yeah, thank you, uh, Manager. Um, <clears throat> I guess I, I'll just try to get a, a you know a high level uh, look at where we're at uh, based on you know previous discussions. Um, uh, one council asked about our <clears throat> you know our staffing as it is today. Uh, we did get through a, a large challenge in the uh, spring and summer. Um, no doubt that uh, there is a nationwide shortage of CDL drivers, and we did a lot of things to, to recruit and get people in place. Uh, and I think we've, you know, had a, a string right through the uh, end of the summer, right through up until um, this first kind of major storm, I'd say, of the year. Um, you know, where we were completing routes routinely, you know, on, on schedule. Um, I can't get into the you know, why we missed three stops on Mount Hope Street, but we will certainly kind of look at that as a, you know, certainly an unusual circumstance that shouldn't happen. But, you know, our staffing levels were good or are good. Um, however, I mean, we're like, like a lot of businesses are, are experiencing, you know, higher levels of absenteeism due to COVID. Um, and so we've had uh, anywhere between 10 and 15% of the workforce uh, out on any given stretch. Uh, certainly the new guidelines are, are helpful in that, you know, we can get 
workers back in after they're healthy and clear and, and can come back in. Um, but we still suffer that same uh, issue uh, on a routine basis. And really that's what's exacerbated just the uh, issue that we run into with the storm. And so, you know, let me start with the storm issue. Um, you know, we, um, in retrospect, uh, on the Friday when it, uh, you know, when it did snow and it snowed, you know, right during you know, our, our normal collections, we our center uh, sent our trucks into the city. We attempted to to do some collections <clears throat> Friday. You know, has a fair amount of hills. Um, the storm was on very hard between seven and you know three o'clock, and um, is good of an effort the, the the city did to clean the streets. Uh, the trucks don't, you know, they they slip, they slide, and um, we had to park them for a period of time. Uh, and we just could not get up and down, you know, the streets, not that we didn't want to, the trucks were getting stuck uh, and we were posing some safety risks. And so we, we had to pull the, the trucks off the road. Manager, you talked about the um, restrictions that we have that um, actually Public Works doesn't have, but we are restricted to um, 60 hours. So a driver cannot work or drive a truck you know, for more than 60 hours. And once we, um, you know, kind of lost time on the Friday because of the, the storm, uh, we just could not pull resources in to get back out and complete the routes on Saturday. And that created a kind of a, a push effect where we're just constantly trying to catch up now. You know, normally we would, um, you know, try to use resources from wherever we, you know, have them. Uh, but again, the COVID numbers are high, not just in the operation that serves the city of Lowell, but in our adjoining operations as well. So, so pooling resources and pulling resources has been difficult. I mean, just to give everybody a, a most current um, where we're at, uh, you know, we, <clears throat> we um, are on the one day delay today, you know, this week because of the holiday, which also adds a lot of confusion to, to residents. You know, you get a lot of calls wondering whether trash is delayed or not delayed. That just always happens in virtually every community that we service. So we're in the, in the delay. Um, we right now are about a quarter of a day behind uh, on collecting trash and about a half a day behind on, on catching up to collect the recycling. So uh, we feel like we'll, um, be fully caught up uh, within the next day to two, and then you know we'll you know we'll be back on track. And um, and again, going back, I think in retrospect, the better decision would have been not to run on the Friday, uh, and then just to have resources available to come back in on on Saturday. But um, you know, I, I can't can't look back now, right? The decision was made, ran, and and it uh, and it backfired. So. Overall, though, our staffing is is um, is good, absent the issues that we're having with um, with COVID. Uh, we do regularly communicate with uh, the city uh, DPW, um, you know, in terms of if we feel like we're going to be uh, delayed or not. Um, certainly, re-examine how that process is going, and and if we can strengthen that so that there can be better outreach to the uh, to the general public. Um, you know, certainly we'll work to that end. Um, and really that's kind of, you know, where we're at. Yes, we're being impacted by a lot of things um, to, to COVID, but, you know, we still are collecting about 10% more waste material and recycling than we did pre-COVID. So the volume have stayed high um, and we're fighting through that and trying to put the resources uh, to it. We, uh, you know, that we need to. Any further questions for the rest speaker? Um, Councillor Gishia. I, I just want to, you know, get clarification from, um, from the person speaking, the 60 hour rule. Um, 60 hours is in seven consecutive days. And after 11 hours of working in one day, you need 10 consecutive hours off. So I'm just wondering how you came to the conclusion of 60 hours when after 11 hours, you have to be sent home for a 10-hour period of rest. So that, that's where the questions come in. 
um, my CDL license. I know that that was the regulation, but I just wonder when you send people home on Friday, how they met that 60 hour window and didn't get the consecutive hours off to drive on Saturday. So if they're, you know, if they're working uh, Monday through Friday and they reach their 60 hours, they have to have a reset. So we can't, we can't put them back out on, on Saturday until they, their hours reset according to the, to the regs. So what you're saying is last week they worked 60 hours before Friday because they, got, they stopped pickup on Friday early because of the dangerous road conditions. So I'm trying to figure out how they were going to finish Friday anyway if there wasn't dangerous road conditions and not be able to work on Saturday. Yeah, so they, they actually, you know, by the time they leave the shop, get to Lowell, uh, they did some work, then they, we parked them for a period of time to see if we could get, you know, get them safely back out there. The storm never let back. By the time we brought them back, uh, the, the crews that, that were there were butting up against their 60 hours on Friday. Are they, are they working more than 11 hours in one day without 10 consecutive hours off? Uh, typically, typically not, but I, I, I don't know, maybe there's a disconnect in terms of the, the rule of the reg, right? So they can, they can drive and they can work more than 10 or 11 hours. They have to log that. And then if they work more than 11 hours, they don't need to take the next day off. So they can work in a rolling seven day period. They can work six, no more than 60 hours in a rolling seven day period. My impression of the law is that if you work 11 consecutive hours, you need 10 hours off. That's not that. Uh, uh, well, we will. We'll disagree on that. Um, and we deal with this kind of constantly. Um, and so I will be happy to revisit the law and how it's written and, and maybe we could talk separately you have a, a pretty good understanding of it to see what you're looking at and then what we you know look at in terms of the laws and the regs also councillor kishia thank you mr mayor councillor yam and councillor mercia uh, this is not a question this is a comment to uh the viewer who watched the uh, the council meeting right now that the city of low has a the low recycling app that I personally download on my phone. It helps a lot um, to know when the trash will, if there is a delay. So I find that's helpful, and I just want everybody who watches, you know, the, the meeting to 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 utilize that. You know, it helps a little bit. Thank you, Councillor Mosia. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to make something perfectly clear. And I understand about road conditions, and I understand about road conditions coupled with a hill and being very dangerous. I understand that. But when someone's recycling should be picked up on a Monday and it isn't picked up until Saturday, and we've called numerous times to make that happen, I also want to say the portion of Mount Hope Street is as flat as you could be. I know there's a particular hill on Mount Hope Street, we're not talking about that end of Mount Hope Street. I'm talking about the end that's very, very flat. And if you want to look it up, it's 242, very flat. So if there was snow or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's quite a flat area. And the two neighbors in the immediate area, I, I'm not familiar with their exact numbers, but I just want to make that perfectly clear. Thank you. Council Robinson. Thank you. A um, couple things that, that was mentioned. Um, half Street's not done. I'd like to echo what uh, Councillor Mercia said over in Centerville. I received calls, plenty of uh, half streets not picked up. I mean, the same street, 15 bar barrels sitting out there, no cars in the way. When we called, dug around, we were told, oh, we have a new driver in COVID. More excuses. Um, a lot of these things listed seem to be the contractor's problem. I understand it. I work in a surrounding community. No problem out there. I mean, I, I don't see any delays. Garbage gets picked up like clockwork. Smaller community, I get it, but 
no delays. Friday snowed out there as well. Again, do we get a discount on our service fee as a result of all these things that are no fault of the cities, no fault of the residents? You listed a plethora of, of, of problems the contract is having. If, if it was, the shoe was on the other foot, we're penalized. And so, I mean, as a spirit of good faith, don't you think it's worth taking a look at it and compensating? Because this isn't the first time, it's not the second time, it's not the fifth time. And again, all we keep hearing are staffing issues with your company. It's, it, it's not the resident's fault. We get it out early, it doesn't come. Then the excuse was, in the past, they weren't out on time with those vehicles in the way. I mean, I think we can do better than this. Thank you. I don't know if the representative would like to, to respond to that or not I we want. Uh, Councilor Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I was just uh, through you to Madam Manager. I'm just curious if you've reached out to any other cities that are, are they having similar issues with other vendors, um, the same issues? Um, also, I wanted to find out when this contract is up um, and what provisions we plan to incorporate. You know, I don't know if there's going to be higher fines. I know in my industry, uh, we have onboard cameras on our trucks that go around. So when there's missed pickups or there's people that say they put their trash out, then, you know, we know that it really didn't happen or did happen. Um, so I'm just curious if we're looking at making changes to this contract going forward. Um, and I also did receive calls from South Lowell um, on missed random pickups. Same thing. Thank you. Madam Manager. So uh, I don't have the contract in front of me. I believe it's uh, in, until 2023. Um, you know, we're always looking at, at that. As I said, if there are, um, and we're, we're very careful about looking at the fine situation in assessing them, in, and it's a process in terms of the language of the contract, we'll always look at the next round, of course, in terms of the contract. But um, this, this contract, I believe, has an, another year plus on it. No other comments? Thank you. Any other comments? If I, if I could. If I, okay, go, uh, you want the representative to go first, Councillor? Okay, please. Uh, oh, I just wanted to make me uh, answer, you know, one question. Uh, Councilwoman asked about, you know, delays. I, I, there's been, you know, a fair amount of um, uh, article and press out there in different communities where companies being impacted by by COVID having, you know, high levels of absenteeism and, um, you know, where they're just seeing the, the same type of situation that we might be running into, you know, here where um, there might be, you know, some some delays in, in finishing collections on the appointed um, day. I think there was an article uh, last week and it referenced uh, a couple of other communities, communities um, and I'll try to pull some of those and, and get those to the uh, manager so you um, you can see that it's, it is just a waste management thing. It's truly really an industry-wide cool. issue. Councilor Rook. Yeah, just a quick question. Back to that August report, Madam Manager. Uh, I know there was a, a negotiation going on f um, to amend um, for the city to pick up the park in the downtown barrels. Um, has there been any finality to that? Uh, I'll refer to the solicitor. The, um, um, there were, we were close to a, uh, uh, an agreement with them and a final settlement. However, um, they were um, um, unable to meet what the demands of that settlement were. And so some other, um, other resolutions are now being explored. Okay, so uh, it also... Uh, <laughs> So the leasing of an interim vehicle to the city, all that stuff, that's out the window too? It, 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 there was one that was provided, but it was ultimately rejected by the city. Okay, so as of right now, waste management still has? It, is, it remains an ongoing issue. There are some other uh, options that are currently being um, negotiated between the parties. Um, and, um, but there, again, there had been an agreement. There had been an attempt at performance on that agreement, uh, but it was... Uh, it was rejected by the city and the parties went back to the table. Okay, and I remember the conversation, I, mean, I think it was a couple hundred thousand dollars the city was gonna buy a new truck for May of, of this year. Correct, that, and we did order a new truck. It, it, so regardless of what we have with waste management, we're gonna utilize the truck? 
we're going to, we, we ordered a, a, a new truck, which I believe we get delivery of in the spring, in May. Okay, hopefully the agreement will be in place by then. In yeah, and, and, and there had been, um, so we did pick up barrels for the parks and, and waste management was crediting us for what, All right. so, so the monetary part was agreed to and we received credit um, for, do, for taking that over. There are other terms that weren't agreed to, and that's what the solicitor's referring to. So, right. but we, we we definitely are getting it, that truck. Okay. All right. Thank you. Supposedly, as long as supply chain doesn't pull something on us. Okay. Um, I know that uh, we'll be expecting a, a report on this as well. There is a relevant motion um, on the agenda. Uh, Councilor Gish here. Uh, before we get there, um, motion 8.11 approved, but Madam Manager, if you could still have Representative No Cell uh, to remain on Zoom to answer questions. Um, Councilor Gish here. Just uh, you want to request a motion to suspend the rule to if, if we motion 8.9 out of order? If we could. Uh, second by Councilor Drinkwater. Again, the motion kind of speaks for itself. Everyone just spoke about everything that is going on with one end. We just, I, I would like to just see the schedule for the spring so that we know that residents can uh, put out their total Let me amount. just read it first, and then uh, you can make a comment on that. Motion 8.9, Councillor Gishia requests city manager provide council with the current yard waste contract and future schedule for yard waste pickup. Councillor Gishia. The motion speaks for itself. We, we just want to know what they can put out, what, we, what restrictions are within the uh, contract. That's all. Thank you. Any other comment? I uh, just want to continue just to thank uh, Madam Manager for recognizing the urgency of the motion by Council Robinson and um, invited the representative to speak today and answer some of the uh, questions. Thank you so much for that. Mr. Mayor, can I make a motion to suspend the rules to take 8.3 out of order? I believe there are a couple of residents who are registered to speak on that motion. Second by Councilor Nguyen. Um, so before I go ahead, then, uh, motion 8.9, motion approved. What was the motion number again, Councilor Ginez? 8.3, thank you. Motion 8.3, Councilor Janess requests city manager provide a report regarding current policies for maintenance of the Riverwalk area, in particular winter snow removal, including any coordination with stakeholders abutting the walkway, NPS, UML, etc. Second by Second. Councilor Mercier. Councilor Janess. Uh, I'd like the speakers to go first, if that's okay. Yes, this is. Um Stephen Oliver. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Stephen Oliver. I'm a professor of Salem State University and a resident of 52 Lawrence Drive, a Renaissance on the River. Um, I lived here for the past six years and noticed that when snowfall happens, very often the river walk goes um, unplowed, causing it to eventually uh, freeze over making a very hazardous situation. Um, the Riverwalk, as you know, is a, is a, is a very oft-used pedestrian thoroughfare through the city. Um, I would argue that it's different than um, a sidewalk, uh, that it should be classified something more similar to a city street, and that it's given priority for clearing uh, when it snows. Uh, people are walking their dogs, they're, they're, they're jogging, riding bikes, unbelievable in this frigid cold, but they are. And oftentimes I can see by the, foot, the footprints in the snow and ice that people are still trying to make their way across uh, this, this walkway uh, despite the hazardous conditions. People use it to move from one part of the city to another. And often when I've called around uh, uh, previous years, it seems that the Riverwalk is not the uh, responsibility of any one entity, 
right? Is it the parks? Is it the city? Is it the owners of the property that abut the, the river walk? Very seldom could I get any clear answers. I want to acknowledge that in uh, the last couple of years after the snow has been on the ground for maybe three or four days, there has been a single path um, that's been cleared out. Somebody on a, a, one of those riding snow blowers. Um, but while I appreciate that and residents appreciate that, it's not sufficient given the width and breadth of the Riverwalk and what people use it for. I also want to point out um, that the Riverwalk, as you know, has many outcrops for viewing the rivers, um, many placards with historical um, information there. It's a major draw for the city, especially with the expansion happening. And I would just like to see there be a policy um, in place that clearly designates whose responsibility is it to clear the snow on the Riverwalk um, when, when, when it occurs. If, uh, if this could be taken up for consideration, um, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. Councilor Kines. I think there's one more, is there one more speaker, Mr. Clark? There was one um, scheduled, but she never, never zoomed in. Okay, I, I, I'll give my comments then, yes. Um, so I had a few people reach out to me about this after the past couple storms. Um, it, as, as Dr. Oliver said, it's you know, a heavily utilized thoroughfare in the city um, that is not just used in the summer. Um, and so I, I'm just curious if we can put together a plan with all of the abutters to figure out you know, what we do with it in the winter. Because as, as far as I understand it right now, it's kind of a free for all. There's no controlling edict or anything about what we do with this space uh, when the snow falls, when it gets icy. I understand we probably can't put salt on it where it's right next to the river and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know, it's, it's kind of a small issue that is gonna be bigger as we connect more things to it, Concord River Greenway, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I see this issue continuing to grow in importance. So I just wanted to bring it forth for discussion. Thank you. Madam Manager. Thank you, um, and through you to the council, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did speak with Commissioner Clancy about this. Um, DPW will look at this and, and come up with a plan, and, if, uh, and we'll give you that report. Uh, I think pulling all the stakeholders is one idea. In the meantime, DPW could uh, try and take responsibility and get them to buy in, but we're gonna, we, we will get a, a, a plan back. I think what has happened as the speaker mentioned, I think um, uh, DPW has, when able, run uh, uh, the equipment down. It sounds like it was just the snowblower type of equipment, but, um, but we will get a more full answer for you. Council Leahy. Thank you, I just had a question maybe to the uh, maker of the motion, but are we talking, like how far are we talking? Are they, uh, People calling you and looking for a mile, a half mile, a quarter mile. Um, I've I've gotten inquiries from residents in the boot mills and residents and as far up as as Lawrence Drive, um, the the Mass Mills building or not the Mass Mills building, the Lawrence Mills building there, um, and so it's really I think that's really the stretch, and then obviously from there it's pretty much in UML's backyard until you get up to the University Ave Bridge from there. Okay, so would the any of the residencies have something to do with this? Would they have responsibility? I think Might the ownership is, is kind of uh, quite questionable. It was federally funded at, at one point, but it's in the city. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to partners like the university and so forth, but it might just be that it's simpler if the city takes responsibility, assuming you know, that we can provide the manpower and clear it and treat it like a, um, a city sidewalk, you know, that is, um, you know, it would be nice if the if there are associations along that would clear it as part of their snow clearing, but um, it might be simpler to get a plan and come back and see if we can tackle it. Sure, thank you. No other comment, motion approved. Mr. Eight. Mayor, can I add one more thing? Oh, sure, Councilor Jeunesse. Sorry, this is uh, going a little out of bounds on this, but I have received similar uh, inquiries from other walkways, uh, near other walkways, and we can talk about that in a future meeting, but that's why I think that this is gonna continue to grow, so thank you. Right, no other comment? 
Motion 8.1, Councillor Mosier requests City Manager have proper department restore the drop box to pay bills at the JFK Plaza entrance to City Hall for residents who do not wish to enter the building. Second by Councillor Robinson. Councillor Mosier. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, on further investigation, I'm happy to report motion completed. Thank you very much. I think it's back out there. People, not everybody wants to go into City Hall and they get used to paying their bills through the drop box and it had to be removed to get into the, get equipment into the doorway for the concession stand and now it's back to normal and it's back where it belongs. So thank you very much, Madam Manager. Motion approved. 8.2, Councilor Janess requests City Manager have proper department investigate drainage issues around a crosswalk at the corner of Market and Palmer Streets. Second by Councilor Yam. Councilor Janess. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to the manager, I know we have the project uh, going on to replace all of the, the bumps on the, by the crosswalks. And so I wanted to include this before that happened in this area. Uh, what happens is this particular crosswalk turns into a pond every time it rains. This time of year, it's more of a skating rink. Um, and there's no way to get around that water or ice without going into the street uh, because on behind the sidewalk there's a large tree and so this area gets particularly bad um, and you know it affects people who are wheelchair users strollers etc cetera, etc cetera. and i just don't want to see anything happen right there in front of the garage um, i can point out exactly where it is if it's of if it's of help but I think it's pretty clear. Thank you. Madam Manager. Thank you. And, and we'll, I, I, I do know uh, Commissioner Clancy had a crew out there and they, and, and I don't know if this will solve it, um, but they found a blocked lateral line. And so they cleared the blockage, removed the, uh, removed um, and the, the blockage and cleaned the case uh, catch basin. So, you know, that, that they'll continue to, to look at if that solved it, but they felt that that may have been what was causing that backup. All right, well, thank you. I walk by it every day on the way to the car, so I'll keep you posted. So when it rains, call me because we I wanna will. know if it cleared it up or not. Thank you very much. Thanks. No other comment, motion approved. 8.4, Councilor Nguyen, Councilor Janess, request city manager update council regarding hiring of a permanent full-time direct of, director of elections. Councillor Nguyen or Councillor Janess, who wants to go first? Uh, Councillor Nguyen, you've been volunteered. <laughs> th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is no reflection of the director's Peloso. He's done a very good job with this past election. I felt that he doing a couple jobs, not just director, interim director for election, is also a hearing officers for the city in terms of those who violate, who, those who have ticket and want to appeal it and all that. He also does work for the law department, I, I believe, do some appellate reviews and whatnot. So, um, you know, um, the salary that we pay director for election here in the city of law is not compatible to other city and town of our side. Uh, because I recall a while back uh, when the position was open um, and there's uh, a lady from Cambridge. She was assistant director in Cambridge. She was, you know, chose to be the next election director for the city of Lowell. With the salary we pay her, she said, no, nope, thank you. I make more over there than, you know, you offer me here. So I would urge the administration to look at other city and town outside and compare that, uh, uh, you know, the salary uh, for the permanent directors, I mean, if, Ali, uh, if Director Peloso choose to remain on the job, you know, so, so be it. Uh, but I, I, I feel that leaving this position, uh, you know, um, as an interim, you know, uh, temporary uh, for too long is not good for the, um, the 
ongoing uh, for the progress of the election department. And, and I also feel too is that maybe uh, going forward that we look at the staffing of the election department. Uh, so from the look at it from the outside, for me, I think they understaffed. Um, that translate to a lot of things that can happen uh, in the city election, either be local election, state, or federal election. And that's why I filed the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, I'd just like to echo uh, Councillor Noon's thoughts on this. I think it's a very important role within the city. Um, obviously, democracy underpins everything we do here. Um, and I also think that uh, Interim Director Veloso has done a good job, a great job uh, in this role. But I also know that um, you know, he'd, he'd like to go back to being a full-time attorney is my understanding. Um, and so filling this role and, and making sure we have someone in this role and all ready to go before we get to the next elections later this year uh, would, would be ideal. Um, and I'm not sure what it's going to take to get there, but I, I want to make sure we, we put our best foot forward and, and try to get there. Thank you. Councilor Leahy, did you want to say, you're just saying wave at me? <laughs> Uh, mo <laughs> motion approved. Motion 8.5, Councillor Yam requests city manager have appropriate department paint the word stop on the streets at all the stop signs throughout the city. Second by Councillor Jeunesse. Councillor Yam. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Um, this motion is a request from the resident who live near the intersection and have witnessed the uh, accident involving drivers who failed to stop at stop sign causing accident. They hope that by painting words stop on the uh, stop sign, especially the four-way stop, will help reduce these accidents and reduce our auto insurance premium as well. This motion doesn't tell the city to uh, paint the word stop at all the stop signs. I'm told that we have like what Councillor Rook said, like 600 or something. But I would love to focus on the intersection that is dangerous and we can focus on that, especially the four-way stop. I can name one right now. It's uh, at the corner of Bower Street and Fletcher Street. Um, the city put a four-way stop without the word and still some people like blew by because they used to drive on Fletcher Street straight up. So the data, the accident data from the police department can tell us uh, which are the eight dangerous uh, intersections so we can start with that. I appreciate that uh, very much and I personally was hit twice by uh, drivers who failed to stop. One driver, she told me that she didn't see the stop sign because the stop sign was blocked by the um, construction of uh, equipment. So I'm hoping that you know we, uh, the city can start with the most dangerous intersection, four-way stop particularly. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Councillor Kishia. I, I think it's a good motion. Uh, in the last few weeks, that's what we're seeing is motions on paintings on, on the ground for traffic control. Before we do anything like that, I, I think that we really should go out and just have all the current markings redone, whether it's the center lines, the fog lines, everything that we currently have put in place and then determine if we have issues and send it to the traffic um, subcommittee. When, when you look at that department down there, it's, it's been cut to the bare bones. You have two people who are gonna retire within the next year and a half. Um, you have just, there's just so much need for painting that it's easy to say, okay, this isn't done and that isn't done. But when you really look at the taxing of that department and all the markings in this city, there's no way that they can keep up. In addition to all the handicapped signs that are being put up and all the handicapped signs that are being taken down in front of people's houses and street signs and everything else. And, you know, they have a 20 year old machine. You know, it, at this point, I think that it would be better off to do all the markings in the city <coughs> first and go out to contract, go to a state bid or something and, and see what the cost is. You could probably do all of them between the detail work, which is the crosswalks and in the long lines, which is the center lines and the fog lines, probably within four days, you know, under a contract. So I think if you put those in place, and, and the reason why they put stop bars in the road was because a lot of neighborhoods don't want the word 
stop painted on their ground. So they have a stop bar that goes across a road that actually, if you're a Massachusetts driver or even a federal driver, you should understand that that's where the stop sign is located. But I do understand what Councilor Yem is saying. When you put up a new stop sign, you do paint the word stop on the ground and you just let it kind of fade away and never put it back. But um, if you can look into seeing what uh, the cost is of, of doing the entire city with long lines and everything, I think that would help out the staff also. Thank you. Motion approved. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor uh, Mercia first and then uh, Is, Councilor Is it Robinson. possible we could suspend the rules and bring in 8.12? Um, Mr. Mason is here for the... Second, Second by Councilor Nguyen. Point twelve. Okay. Corey, Motion 8.12. Council Robinson requests city manager look into feasibility of installation of solar panels on the Robinson School property. Second by Councilor Mercia. Council Robinson, would you like to speak? Or the speaker go first? There's a couple on Zoom. Um, John Grossman. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak on this. Um, my name is Jonathan Grossman. I live at 83 Varnum Ave. And I'm active with an uh, <clears throat> organization called 315 Mass of Greater Lowell, which works to address the climate crisis here in Lowell and across the state. And I just want to uh, speak in favor of the motion. This kind of thing is exactly what we need to do. To address the climate crisis, we have to try to use, transition to renewable energy whenever we can. And I also appreciate the comments that were made earlier about the high school um, and the thinking that's going on there. Um, where we can do it, we need to do it as fast as possible. State law requires 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. That's pretty soon. And there's a reason for that timing. Um, so I just, uh, that's why I'm speaking in favor of the motion. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, having solar panels at a school is, has other benefits. Um, people see it, it's educational. So uh, I hope the motion passes and the project can go forward. Thank you. Um, Jay Mason. I thought he was on Zoom. Oh, uh -huh. not on Zoom. Hello, my name is Jay Mason. I live at 415 Pawtucket Street, number one, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, we can and we should do everything possible to do solar at the Robinson School. I am in full support. We are a community fighting a major battle to fight climate change. Solar at the Robinson would be a useful step. I heard a cost issue related to solar on the high school earlier. By the way, we should do a 300 kW solar array on the high school as well. But cost issues can be addressed in many ways. We don't have to buy the panels ourselves. We don't have to have a line item in the construction budget. <clears throat> we can get a PPA system, a system by PPA, Power Purchase Agreement. That's a lease. We did that 10, uh, excuse me, we did that in 2010, 12 years ago, on four schools. And those four schools were the uh, Shaughnessy, the Pawtucket Memorial, the Riley, and the uh, Butler. And the total of those four schools, just by the way, is about 330 kilowatts of uh, solar power. That's about equal to what we're hoping to do on the high school. So uh, just some parallels there that I found uh, interesting. So I think we should do a, a system on the Robinson. I think the cost issue is something we can address. Uh, those four schools are great examples, and in eight years from now, in 2030, that 20-year lease is going to expire, and those panels will belong to the city. We will no longer be paying uh, a service to a, an entity. It'll be our, our system. Now, granted, those panels are not all going to survive. They're not going to last forever. But I have a good sense that they're going to be pretty operable for the most part. And I'd like maybe to find out in our you know, subsequent research that gets done on this motion to, to see what we might project for a lifetime of those of those panels possibly. But why support this solar work? Well, why do solar on the Robinson or, or the high school? Well, we, we passed an ordinance called the Road to 100%. The goal of this unanimously passed ordinance 
is to accelerate the transition to 100% clean energy by 2035. That's only 13 years. And we've only done those four schools at the, uh, at those four, four schools, we've done um, five or six other um, solar projects, including the 1.5 megawatt uh, program at the uh, landfill, but we haven't, that was in 2014. We haven't done anything since 2014. And I'm not saying that to criticize, I'm just, it's a, it's a fact that we need to consider as we move forward. What are we doing to fight climate change? What are we doing to fight this, uh, to fight this battle to get clean energy, which is really important. Um, so the actions resolved in the road to 100%, just to recap real quickly, because we, 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 we authored this, we, we voted unanimously to support this. We were gonna urge the state delegation to do everything in their power to facilitate the transition to clean energy. The city council was gonna go on record in supporting the goal, which we did, which you did. Uh, and the city of Lowell will take concrete actions to promote clean energy. And uh, those clean actions include um, solar. So uh, I think we can get where we need to go. We just have to have the resolve. We have to have the will to get where we need to go and it's not that hard. And we don't even have to pay for it. So I would, um, I would like to say we, 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 we've got a significant task to achieve 100% clean energy by 2035, but solar is one of those steps. And I urge the council to reflect on the critical need for doing this and transitioning to clean energy as soon as possible. And thanks to energy manager Kathleen Moses who helped me a little bit with some research. Thank you. Councilor Robinson. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank the speakers tonight. Um, Real brief, this idea came to me from one of my neighbors while I was out campaigning. They, they brought up the point of uh, in Centerville, some green space that we have that's underutilized, the Robinson School Hill. They asked, what could we do with Robinson School Hill to try to see if there was any kind of savings? I dug around a little bit. I noticed that the uh, water department, renewable energy credits being generated, FY19, they realized 276,000. FY20, they realized 249,000. FY21 and FY22, they're looking at about 225,000 in renewable energy credits over at the water department. Um, I think Robinson School Hill is one great location. It's full sun. It's not utilized because it's so steep and um, it's a pain to maintain, I'm pretty sure. I, I was tasked with it for about six years while I worked at the DPW, so. If, if there's any way we could really look at installation there and is, in any other spots that might pop up in the city to help us move towards the goals that were mentioned and offset operating expenses for electricity up at the Robinson and the McAuliffe compound, I mean, it, to me, it seems like a no-brainer. So any, any information would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Any other comment? Um, I just have a quick comment, uh, Madam Manager. Um, th this is a good motion and I suppose that could be applied to many schools throughout the city. Would that be a feasibility to look at other schools as well, if this could be, um, could be done? Uh, we, could, we could certainly talk to um, Catherine Moses and, and others about a feasibility study in, in terms of um, you know, assessing the feasibility, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Going back to the uh, motions in order. Motion 8.6, Councilor Gishia requests city manager have all Lowell High School renovation building committee meetings air live on LTC. Second by Councilor Scott, Councilor Gishia. Thank you, Mayor Chow. I was excited to look at this whole project from the beginning of being elected. So one of the first things I did was go to the website to try to figure out, okay, how can you follow along and, and try to get up to date with the building project? So the first place I visited was the Lowell High Project website. And I quickly noticed that it said that every first Thursday of the month at 5.30, the building committee met. So I was excited to look for the minutes of, of that also. And when I, when I dove into it, I've only seen two meetings from at least the, the minutes that I could find were two meetings from the building committee. 
One was on February 4th, and the other one was on December 9th. Uh, one of them was 36 minutes, and the other one was 33 minutes for a total. And, and I, don't, I don't know if this is correct or not. I'm just going off a of website information that's on the city. Um, a little over an hour and nine minutes total for this building project, which to me seems like um, we're not doing our due diligence to the building committee or to the project itself. When I was at Greater Little Tech and they did a $65 million project, which was nothing compared to what's going on today at the high school at the $343 million, we met once a month and we were there at least an hour and a half. And people had talking points going on and on and on. Um, and sometimes we were there twice a month because we were looking at many things from the scope of work, the budget, the schedule, MSBA updates on, on spending and, and um, the community outreach. Uh, so. I just think that this committee, uh, when, when it first started, the first meeting you had an 81% attendance from the building committee, but then it quickly went down in December to, 80, uh, to 52% um, on that committee. And also, when you look at it, I didn't see our own building department. When, when I looked at none of them are on there, and I didn't see Jim Green. I didn't see Jim Green at either meeting. And he's got to maintain this facility, so I'm really, struggling to understand how we're actually looking at this when most of the people who are on there uh, don't have the background for a lot of it. So we just basically take points from what I'm just reading. A lot, uh, most of the notes are about uh, minority hiring and um, such. So when, when I look at it, I don't see much on questioning of materials being used. Is there a way we can put more solar panels on? That's why these questions are coming up about this project. I would ask that, and again, if you're a resident and you were looking at this project and you went on and you read that website, it says 5.30 is the meeting. All of the meetings that have taken place have been at 5 o'clock and have taken roughly the 30 minutes. So when you get on to LTC, Channel 99, the, minute's over, the meeting's over. I just think we have to have more public input on it. I think that we have to be more visible to the public, and I just think that this project is going to take a turn that maybe, I, I don't believe we're hearing everything. Everybody's positive about it, and I understand that, and, and I think that maybe I'm just looking because I'm looking through that greater Lowell vision when we're looking at, and we already heard the word valued engineering. In 1980, they value engineered that high school project, and we lost science labs. So I'm just worried about you know the community input, the spending, um, everything together, and, and I would implore everyone to at least meet once a month and put a schedule together that outlines the scope of work, the budget, scheduling, the MSB update, MSBA updates. I think that that's a valuable point. Um, what are we being paid? How are we going out? Is there things that we can look for? Are there things that we are not getting paid? Um, so that's really my concern about that project is just more involvement of the community. As this has been brought up in the last two weeks, you're seeing people as getting energized by it, and there's a lot of questions. So I just would hope that we would be more involved into the public and, and try to get that uh, group to meet more, or, or we just change the group and go to people who want to meet once a month and, and have the expertise in it. Because without Jim Green there, who has to maintain it with his staff, to me, Ricky Underwood does custodians. That's what I see out of it. And I see that he has the EMS portion to the HVAC, which I still don't understand how he controls that. And, and Jim Green doesn't have a point in that, but he has to maintain repairs. So I, I just, there's a crossover that we really truly need to put a facilities department together, put somebody at the head of this, and understand where this city's going and the future of maintenance of their buildings. Thank you. Madam Manager. Thank you, and, and we'll, we'll um, follow up. I, I, I did want to point out, we'll give you this information too, um, Councillor, that there are weekly meetings that happen on this project that, that include everybody from school side, the building commissioner, the commissioner of public works, a lot, and, and I'll give you the whole lineup, that they meet every single week on, on could, this. Could we also, could we televise those? No. We, but I'll get you that report. Okay. Um, and, and in terms of getting more active, especially as we're going into another phase, I think it would make uh, good sense for the uh, school building committee. But there is, there, because of the makeup of 
uh, the city and also the size of the project. There's a lot of work on this project, but we'll get you all that information. What, what I heard from the speaker earlier was uh, the easy part is done. I think That's in terms I I of um, actually phase one and phase two are pretty straightforward new construction. I think that was what he was saying. And so, but as, but even phase two has some components that are complicated, especially when you are talking about taking down part of the 1980s building as part of phase two and having a construction site while kids are going to school. So um, that, those are the challenges, which is something that was known from the beginning and that are being planned for. So I think all of those updates are important, especially as we come into the next phase. Thank you. Councilor Rook. I think it's just out of curiosity, Madam Manager, what's something that an example that can't be shown on TV, a discussion or a topic that can only be done in private? Are you talking about um, well, I mean, because of the, not not the you. school building committee that should be on TV. Okay, but you meet once a week to discuss. Yeah, it's like project. any any contract negotiations or things that happen all the time in plan E form of government. So, um, you know, in terms of just ongoing uh, input in reports, we can give you reports, but it's like you know any of the projects that, that are going all the time. It's not that they're secret, it's just the operation of city government. So then what's the use of having a school building committee then? If all you have a school done. building committee. Um, there are some communities that, uh, depending on the size of the project and the, the makeup of the government, um, but for instance, in the city of Boston, the school building committee, I think meets three times uh, during the course of it because it's, it's basically done by the city administration and then updates go to the school building committee. So it depends on the size of the community and the projects. So each, it's a, but you follow MSBA rules. Okay. Councilor Kishio. J just a point of clarification. Under the MSBA guidelines to get the funding, Councilor Rook, you have to have a building committee. Hearing no other comments, motion approved. Motion 8.7, Councilor Gishio requests city manager provide council with the COVID protocol policies for disinfecting all the, school, all the city buildings, schools, city owned equipment, vehicles, and common areas. Second by Councilor Mosia. Councilor Gishio. Thank you, Mayor Chow. The motion speaks for itself. Thank you. Motion passed. Motion 8.8, .8. Councilor Gishio requests city manager provide council with a report on the number of homeless that use the Lowell Transitional Living Center, the Elliott Day Program, Life Connection Center, or the non concrete hotel during the recent cold snap, second by Councilor Drinkwater. Councilor Gishio. Uh, through you to the manager, I, I just want to thank you and your staff for providing this for the homeless. I, I think that it was a great opportunity for everyone and hopefully we saw people get out of that cold and, and, and we continue to see it, but, uh, and I wanna thank you and the motion speaks for itself. Motion approved. Motion 8.10, Councilor Robinson, Councilor Gishio request city manager provide council with an update on all fully funded positions that are currently vacant in the fiscal year in FY22 budget, including the length of time they have been vacant. Councilor Robinson or Councilor Gishio want to go first? I think the motion's pretty clear. Councilor Gishio, motion approved. Motion 8.13, Councilor Robinson requests city manager provide council with an update on the current status of the city's plan to mitigate and or eliminate the practice of brownouts within the Lowell Fire Department Second by Councillor Nguyen. Councillor Robinson. Thank you. Um, I know these discussions were taking place last year. Um, it's more or less trying to get a feel. I, I, I know it's winter time, freezing cold. We have ice on the Merrimack and the canals. I'm hearing that there's been some periods where uh, I believe it was the rescue had to be closed down as part of this ongoing 
whatever we're doing to mitigate uh, brownouts at nighttime. But again, um, I just think it's a, it's a dangerous game of roulette. So any information as to where we are currently and working towards mitigating or eliminating brownouts would be great. Thank you. Councillor Nguyen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's very good motions, Councillor Robinson. I know that back in January of last year, Councillor Mercier and Councillor Rock filed a similar motion. The idea is to reduce company closing or so-called brownout. And um, the manager heard uh, our call and directed her team, the finance team, uh, Connor Baldwin, uh, in 2021 uh, to appropriate additional $1.5 million on top of the fiscal 22 um, fire department budget, which is something that every council here, past and present, uh, feel is important. Public safety is key for everyone here and everyone at home. And that's why uh, the call was heard and the funding was put forth and the report certainly are going to ask for an update or see what's going on with that. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Janess. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank you, Councillor Robinson, for this motion. Um, I wanted to piggyback on it a little bit and ask if we could get some information with this to learn what is causing the various brownouts. You know, how many of these brownouts are caused by staffing issues, whether it's people being out with COVID or us having uh, positions that aren't filled uh, versus equipment issues, trucks that are broken and need repairs, et cetera, versus um, the, the state of our firehouses, which we all understand needs, needs some serious investment. Um, so just trying to really understand what we can do to get really the most bang for our buck here to really go after, uh, see what we can do to really tackle the issues that are causing as many of the brownouts as possible. Um, just, just looking for that info. So thank you very much. No other comment, motion approved. Motion 8.14, Councilor Rook requests city manager contact Mass DOT concerning Rook Bridge inspections and any upcoming plans for redesign and construction of new bridge. Second, Second. by Councilor Nguyen. No more, sir. Councilor Rook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Obviously, the last couple of weeks, there's been uh, some problems over with the Rook Bridge um, and with the uh, piece of the flooring coming up. And Madam Manager, I heard something over on Saturday that happened where the DPW was telling some vehicles not to use the Rook Bridge. I mean, I, I heard that on a radio station. I'm not sure if that, I haven't heard anything other than that. I don't know if you're aware uh, of you know, something um, was wrong with, with, with the bridge. So that, again, that could just be a, a story that's out there, but I heard it yesterday. So I'm not sure if you're aware that. I, I, I'm not, but we'll, we'll check okay. and see. I know that on Saturday, um, Christine Clancy did uh, speak with MassDOT about the situation out on the bridge. Um, that was with the, the turn up of the- of Yeah, the, the panel yeah. And, and how it damaged- Okay, right, yeah. More than one car. And then so is it, uh, are they still doing, um, is it every two years that they do an inspection of the bridge as well? Um, I, I think that the last inspection came before the council a couple of years ago, so hopefully that's, and usually they do before the winter time comes. I know they do replace panels um, periodically over there. And then obviously finally with um, the replacement of the bridge, I know option three is the preferred option uh, that came before the council last year. Um, and I do think that now is probably the optimum time to, to really make a hard push for it. Um, you know, there's a $100 million transportation bond bill that needs to go uh, past Governor Baker. Uh, to get through uh, for design, and then also you know, the one billion dollars from the federal government um, for just bridges to the state of Massachusetts. Um, I would uh, suggest a um, motion, Mr. Mayor, maybe uh, that uh, Madam Manager may put a letter together um, to uh, to the governor. Um, you know, staying in support that the city, uh, the council, uh, I would invite our state representatives and our state senator to sign it as well, uh, pushing the importance of getting this done. Uh, especially at the time where we are close, we are a basically a decision away from the governor from pushing this forward uh, for $100 million. Uh, I would also uh, 
make a motion to await a letter to the Congressman Mr. Hand's office. Um, now this is a billion dollars coming in. Uh, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, you know, and to, to get up there and talk about national agenda items and stuff is terrific, but you know, uh, you're elected to represent the people that, uh, that you serve, um, and we are them. Uh, so I really hope that her office puts the best put forward uh, to get the funding that's gonna be needed to backfill the $100 million. Um, so uh, I would ask that those, both those things happen. Um, hopefully maybe by next meeting we can sign those and, and send them off. You know, it really is time to, uh, to make a, a hard, hard push for this. Um, you know, this may be the only realistic chance we have for a long time to get this done. Thank you. Any other comment? Motion approved. Nine, announcements. Any announcements? Councilor Yam? Um, this is not an announcement, but I just want to let the Madam Manager know that um, I really appreciate um, the crew that went out on Monday to plow. Um, they did a very good job, particularly in the acre area. I just want to say thank you to them for their hard work. Just a quick uh, announcement uh, you find in your folder tonight are the subcommittee assignments, and I want to thank each one of you for responding to uh, my request to, re to rank your, your preference for those subcommittees. And I did the best I could to match your, your preference to the subcommittees that, that you requested. And I want to wish um, all the members on the subcommittees uh, the best of luck and looking forward to see all your achievements in those subcommittees. 10, adjournment. Motion by Councillor Leahy, second by Councillor Drinkwater.